the afternoon of day 21 of the Alec Murdoch murder trial. I can't believe we are into week five. It looks like this trial will go into a sixth week. I know we live here now. At the beginning of the case, the attorneys had estimated it would be a three-week trial. The judge let in a bunch of 404 other acts evidence, and the prosecution made a meal of it and brought in everything they could possibly want, which I think extended the trial by maybe four days at least. The defense has a week of their case in chief, a little less than a week because Monday was a holiday. So they have about four days of their case in chief. They think they'll be done on Friday. This witness we have at least the rest of the afternoon with. The witness on the stand right now is Mike Sutton, a forensic engineer, who was talking about bullet trajectories and opined right before the lunch break that the shooter in this case had to be between um, five two and five foot four. We haven't even gotten to the cross examination yet because, well, you know, we're hearing that there's at least another hour of Poot asking questions. I think they're going to ask about gunshot and how the sound travels with gunshot because that's one of the areas he's been qualified in as an expert. <sighs> we have a lot more to do this afternoon. Look, these days, these days and trials are slow and long, and we've been through days and trials that are slow and long. It's just. Uh it's just, it's kind of painful. So we're going to chat a little bit. We're waiting for court to come back on stream. We're going to answer some questions. I am, are y'all tired? I'm tired. I'm tired. Today's witnesses are like, oh, and I know they're foundational, but my brain checked out when they were doing this on the prosecution side too. This is not defense specific. It's foundational testimony. It takes very long to get to the point. It's very hard to go from the point and then work backward. They need to they need to build the foundation to get to the point. But then when you don't know what the point is, you're sitting here going, and, and, and what does any of that mean? And the chat has all asked, hey, do we know that those came from the day of the incident? Maybe the one in the doghouse, because the one in the doghouse has a 300 blackout round. It seems like if you had accidentally shot into a doghouse that you might go retrieve that bullet before a pupper went back in there. But we don't have any any information about the side of the bird cages and whether or not the side of the bird cages were there before or after. We just don't know. So with all of that, uh, court is still not back. Let's roll the intro. We didn't get to do it. Um, and we can just talk about the things. We can all sigh together because we're invested, right? It's like a TV show. We talked about this being like the final seasons of Lost. It's like I'm invested, but I'm done, but I'm invested. But I'm done, but I can't turn away because now I'm invested. And in this court, we can go like a baseball game through hours of stuff that you're just like, really? And then all of a sudden something fiery happens and we all go, oh, where'd that come from? And that is why we watch every minute of these trials. When I committed at the beginning of this trial, I was like, three weeks, it's going to be great. I mean, a lot of murder trials are a week, six, seven days, maybe, maybe less, two, three days sometimes, depending on the case. And now we are 21 days in and so deeply invested, we can't leave, even if we want to, even when we're like, oh God, no, please make it stop. So I've got my notebooks. I'm now on notebook number three. Um, I'm going to be getting ready. I know y'all, how many times have I said we've got quick bits things to do, but y'all know I was out. Well, the members know. I was out um, this weekend. I was going to work on Quick Bits Sunday and ended up meeting um, meeting new a new acquaintance and a friend for lunch or a new friend and a friend for lunch on Sunday down in Atlanta. But, you know, Atlanta's not super close to Nashville. It's close enough to drive, but it took most of the day on Sunday. So Sunday was supposed to be Quick Bits <laughs> and it wasn't. All right. Just come on. Let me know what you're drinking. Today we've got Waterloo Lemon Lime because my husband delightfully went to the store and I had run out. So I've got a cup full of ice and uh, a heart full of dreams. And I hope that this makes sense and becomes very interesting because uh, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Misty says, you drove right by me. I probably did. I mean, there's really only the one way. There's really only the one way. Let us go. Let us roll. Let us chat. Welcome to the Emily Show. That's not the right intro. 
This hey one. there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. We are absolutely professionals here. It just, these, these things, they happen we're still waiting for the court to come back. I'm going to answer some questions. I've got Waterloo Black Cherry here, too. Today, I just went with the lemon lime. I really enjoyed the lemon lime. And after lunch, it was a more savory lunch. The lemon lime feels about right. Same with TV show How I Met Your Mother was done but invested. We talked about this a few days ago. We have said this about Grey's Anatomy and other shows. It's like, I'm done, but I need to see how it ends. There are a few housewife franchises, I feel like, too. But once they kind of cycle out the OG cast sometimes, if I don't get invested in the new cast, I'm like... I don't know, man. I don't know if I I don't know if I have the time for all of this. I don't know why my studio is being weird. I don't Miglina, I don't see our starred um comments at all. I don't know. Oh, they're 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 back now. My um the back end of my studio is just being a little strange for a minute because sometimes the internet's the internet. All right. Not a fan of the bleep in the intro. David G, I understand that. YouTube. YouTube is not a fan of me not putting a bleep in the intro, and I do try to play nicely with the platform that I really enjoy. So that's why there's a bleep in the intro. It was either taking the whole thing out or leaving the bleep in, and so that's where we are. Uh, Leela said, I'm trying to not make a decision until I hear all of both sides. My, hummy hear me, my hubby hears me say, I can't stand dick. What a funny look I got, I'm sure. I'm sure, as like when my 14-year-old walks in, I'm like, dick, really? And my kid's like, what? I'm like, it's his name. Trust me. It's just, it's just his name. It's just his name. Um, but there are times his style just rubs me the wrong way. And the thing is, um, when we are, when we are this far along into a trial, if the jury is already tired of people's shit, and I think in this case, there is a fair argument that the jury is tired of all of the attorney's shit, not just the defense. If if they are tired, everything is not funny anymore. Now the jury was told a three week trial. We are now looking at going into six weeks, and they are not they are not going to be humored. They are not going to be humored at all. They're just going to be like, really, this this is what we're doing. Which means the attorneys have to read the jury and make sure they are getting absolutely to the point because you can see where I've done long trials. It wears on the attorneys, but you can see the wear on the jury and they have to be mind. The attorneys in the case have to be very mindful of that. They have to see, see the wear, see the fatigue. And in this case, a real big problem is the attrition. We are, we have lost three jurors, four jurors, and we are now at only two alternates left. You normally want at least one alternate per week plus an extra one. So on a three-week trial, you'd normally go with four or five. But in this case, now that we're getting into six weeks, we only have a few a few alternates left, and that is a problem for this case. All right. Judge Newman's taking the bench with his, I think it's an iPad Pro that he carries out every day. Seems like an iPad Pro. Looks like an iPad Pro. He likes blue. We got the blue tie today. We got the blue chair. We got the blue iPad cover. I'm here for it. I don't know what he's going to say, but I would rather hear the judge talk um, at this point than any of the attorneys. They have worn on me. Though one of the prosecutor, prosecutors that annoys me the least, I guess I should say, is the one doing the cross-examination of this expert. Bring them, in. bring them in today. Not bring the jury, but bring them in. All right. Let's bring them in. Bring the jury. Let me turn up the court volume. I didn't want to get scared by the bailiff again. The bailiff who says, come to order, um, scared the shit out of me a few days ago. And I'm now trying to be very mindful of how much it terrifies me when he's like, bring the jury. We're not even into cross-examination yet. We're still on direct examination of forensic engineer Mike Sutton. And even though there's a lot of leading questions, and even though it's Dick, we're in the defense case. Just a reminder, prosecution case goes first, then the defense, then the rebuttal, then closing. Witness is back on the stand. And when we talk about doubt, the job of the defense is not to prove Alec innocent. What the defense is trying to do with their case 
is instill doubt in the mind of the jury. Reasonable doubt does not the mean is present, sir. does not mean Thank beyond you, all you possible doubt. It means beyond reasonable doubt. But if two explanations are reasonable, so, you go with not guilt. Done. You liar! You can't be almost done. Before lunch, you said you had more than an hour. I gotta tell you, over lunch, I was thinking about how to demonstrate. Why a soliloquy? A little more graphically, what you're saying. <sighs> Your Honor, may I take uh, this uh, weapon out of its box? Yes, sir. Oh, Thank Jesus. You. Sweet Lord, we are getting back to him pointing guns at people. Uh, okay, thank you. I, this, you know what this is? Yes. What is it? Uh, it's the, uh, I think it's a, you know, like an exemplar 300 the, blackout. Rifle. It's not an exemplar. It's one of the um, family's guns, but okay. And this is the weapon, a weapon like this that the shooter would have had. This is the weapon the shooter yes. had? Poot, that's not what you want to ask. Okay, he said so, a weapon like this. He corrected very quickly. <coughs> Poot likes walking around with that gun, doesn't he? A visual of... Oh God, oh God. I'm gonna come down here so I don't point at you. That's good. We like that, okay. Let me, let me come up there and come this way. We definitely don't want you pointing at people, you Poot. We appreciate that. Um. So I'm not five foot two, or five foot four. I think you said five foot three or five foot four. Oh, you gotta make it but clear. Position I, me. I am not. Neither am I, Poot. <laughs> Tempting, but um. <laughs> Oh, that's appalling. I, don't know how I can do this. I'm that's not funny. Somebody. He was. Here's why I'm appalled. He was pointing towards the prosecution, and he said, okay, so "Tempting." Position me that's, as that shooter would be. You're in a double homicide trial. That's not funny. And the prosecution did not object and put it on the record, and they should have. Your wrist will have to bend. This wrist. Ew. Right. Like this? Ugh. Yeah. I and mean, you obviously you could you could crouch in some sort of a shooter stance. They laughed. But that's oh, people laughed. That. That's going to be variable. Yes. Okay. And as I approach the quail pan, the gun has to go. Mm -hmm. up. Stay, well, it stays the same angle, right? But for different height people, the gun has to get higher and higher. Right, like that. And if I go backwards, it's got to get lower and lower. Right, because if you walked up to the quail pen, the hole's 50 <laughs> inches above the ground. Metters, right Metters looks so like, like his soul is down. leaving his body right now. Like Look at him. Right. About Look like at a little bit lower, <laughs> about like that. The prosecution the is just like, fuck So you can see, if you back up, you have to get lower and lower and lower. Not what, but the gun has to stay the same angle. Oh, so it's got to be up, but up. I go down. You go down. Or to, get short. To, be, to put the barrel on that green line. So he's going to make this as awkward as I'm possible four, to make sure it looks um, like it's impossible. Measure, uh, this is, so this is be, not being right. able to pull a so glove on your hand. That's what they're trying to do. That's the moment they're trying well, to have. If, if you're six foot four, um, you know, Metters is all of us right now. Your hip is going to be about, about 46 inches. Didn't you measure to Alex hip? Didn't you measure that? Right Isn't that here. one of your many measurements okay, that you 46. zoomed, zoomed through in your right. PowerPoint? So you've got your trigger right. again, right. about where your hip is. So it would have to be, your trigger hand is going to have to be up where I've got, I'm pinching the tape measure. And this is how far away from the... the uh, that looks normal. Well, it could be anywhere, but if, but if, you, if you raise it some more... Your trigger hand has to be there. Okay. A little bit lower. Right? We're going with it if the gun doesn't fit. If, you know, if you're at the quail pin, the hole is right here. Right? Even if you shoot from the hip. Demonstratives can be very powerful. If I'm back where you say the, the lines converge... It was the soliloquy about tempting. Low, right? Yes, that I wasn't very, here for. It has for. to be very low. That's why it's, it's to get a position that would be either shooting or aiming, right? Or you know, a, a basic shooting position. You need, to be, you need to be shorter. If you're bending over in some other body position, 
that may be, you know, maybe somewhat of an awkward shooting position. Well, it matters. You can be taller, right? You, you can be taller than five feet or five foot. But his, I think you told us his uh, foot to knee was 25 inches. 25 inches. And would it be? And, and oh, we can't see matters any better over here. Fortunately for me, where would fortunately I for you. This your is harder hand to see. is going to have to be about down where your kneecap is. Right about here? About like that. He's right? making and it awkward. And upwards three degrees. Oh. That, that would be the equivalent of somebody who's six foot four. I'm waiting for him to go, nah, my knee. In the area where the two shot lines cross, shooting into the quail pen. They would be holding the gun like that if they were on their feet. If, if they were on their feet. Okay, thank you. Please take a stand. Thank you, sir. So what Poot did that I was not a big fan of is that he was pointing the gun towards the audience where the prosecution's table is, and he was like, tempting. And then he said, where can I be that I'm not pointing this at anyone? That's an improper soliloquy. Okay. So, Creighton didn't stand up and object. Poot objected so vehemently when Metters said, did I say something funny? trigonometry is what you're saying. It's just, it's not, um, it's not appropriate at the all. Would have been between 5'2 and 5'4, and no. back to have the... The um, ejected shells in the appropriate place. You mark that place on this sketch where these two these two folks are. That's sort of the rain. Yes, and uh, you can see some of the ejected shells oh, no, at the right side. Oh no, not contempt at all. I'll body. explain that later. It's just, just improper. Off it's kind of a pull where I've got the yellow sticky. Okay, that is the area where you have. Um, I believe uh, two, three, and four. So three empty, 300 blackout case, cases. Okay. And that would be consistent with the position of the shooters in this position and based on the angle of the um, the bird cage, the bird uh, cage, um, they would be somewhere between five, two, and five, four. I've got to say, to, to have, to have as we have gotten into week five, I officially down. missed yes. all of the depth feed herd attorneys, all of them. Let's move on. All of them. In our presentation. All. And I'm going to try to expedite this a little bit and skip some slides because I missed that Virginia I courtroom. I missed the audio. We talked about this. I missed the demonstratives uh, on the screen. The so let's go with the Paul Murdoch first shot. Tell us what this is. Uh, so this was. Um, these first pictures are from the night of the murders, and that's inside the feed room. On the south wall of the feed room, there's just a regular window. And what's that? Those are uh, pellet holes from the buckshot. There are nine pellets in buckshot, this particular load of buckshot. Okay. And I do. I miss Elaine. Even Elaine. What did you do? Even Elaine and her so what I did, to what, turn on a picture, mic. Please. All of it. I miss it all. When I looked at the, there's the window from the outside of the feed room. That's helpful. When I looked We've at never the crime seen that before. Pictures, I noticed that one of the buckshot pellets hit a pine tree and sled take, took a picture of that damage to the bark of the pine tree. And so when I was there, there the tree, there's like a, a stand of pine trees that have been planted behind the kennels. Right. And so what I did, there are nine pellets, but the pellets had already spread out by the time they went through the window. In fact, there was one pellet still wedged in the windowsill itself. That you found? That I found. Um, but there, there was a tree and it had some ivy on it, but it had damage. And so what I did was I located that damaged tree and put a mark on it. I put, just put some yellow tape there. I went back in the feed room. If you look at the pictures of the feed room, there are some bloody footprints from tennis shoes. And it's, it's uh, just as uh, I believe it was uh, Chief Deputy Kinsey talked about um, Paul being about midway in the room. That's, that's the approximate location. So I stood there, but I knew Paul got shot in the chest. So I lowered my head about eye to chest level, and I looked through each hole until I saw the tape on the tree, which is where the sap was coming out, where the pellet had hit it. So I, I determined which hole in the window belonged to that pellet. And then what I did, instead of using a trajectory rod or laser, it was daytime, I did the old school method, which I stretched a neon pink string from the damage of the tree old through school, the hole you in just the window measured it. Out, out the door. Because from what I have understood, you know, this shot 
um, was taken within three feet or so because there was uh, stippling on this wound here. So what I did was I basically took the string out as far as you needed to go, and um, which is what is in that picture there. This would be but this string. is yes, that is simply a string. It's pulled tight at what rate from the sap grow, coming though? out of the tree where the buckshot pellet hit it through the hole in the window, and then back through the feed room. How long to I set up a tripod in the door? So that that's the that is the shot line, or the I don't trajectory. Know, how trees grow of the. Uh, the pellets in the shotgun and there's that's where the damage to the tree is it's it's leaking sap okay. but the tree would have grown since and, and that was the that was shooting. the hole in the window that if i stood where paul roughly where paul was this was october um shot in the chest it was the only hole that lined up with that tree 18 months later yep okay, and then what is, what is this and that shows uh basically at the door sill the threshold of the door to the feed room the height of the shot, which was. I try to agree with all of you. <clears throat> At the door sill, it's three foot 11. Okay. Was it on an upward trajectory? Upward trajectory. Okay. Next. And I so, don't know if they're going to so ask for a jury. What I view. did there is just to demonstrate it. Obviously, because there's a string there, can't put the barrel right on the string line like we did in the computer with the green lines. I just held it beside it. I'm five foot 10. I have normal shoes on here. That's the stance that I would have to take to shoot up that string. So and it's, it's not a very difficult that stance. That hole in the chest on that trajectory. Um, that's, that's like about right at my hip or so. Yeah, maybe, maybe, just a, maybe just a little bit lower than my hip if you looked at the butt of the gun. And I'm five ten. You're how, how tall? 5'10". So it's somebody, not 5'2 to 5'4", but somebody slightly taller. Right, or, yeah, or moving the gun up and down again, there's, there's a variable here, of course. Okay. And then what I did was demonstrate, because there have been some, you know, talk, well, that's me standing, again, I'm fairly comparable in height to Paul Murdoch, and what I did was I just let the string touch where the wound is in his chest, the entry wound. And if you look where my feet are, you'll see I'm just beyond the door. Which That's is right not where the low, though. So another way of confirming that this, this all makes sense here. And with, those are the bloody footprints. Those are the bloody footprints. That's about where I'm standing when this picture of me was taken with the string going through, you know, That's we're not within an awkward you know, shot. a few inches or so. And then the idea there, that, that would be, um, you know, inconsistent with, say, somebody my height. I think there's one more picture here just to drive the point home. Like if I shouldered a shotgun and shot into the feed room, that wouldn't work. The gun needs to be lower. Well, we know that. Um, so similar concepts as we said before, but just done a different way. Dick wanted a jury okay. view. I don't think they're going to get it with how far beyond okay, time we are. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, before we get into acoustical testing, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about the second shot on Paul. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard that. I believe you watched my cross-examination of Deputy Kinsey, correct? Yes. And um, his testimony was? Not objection. Do you remember what his testimony was? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, he analyzed the data and physical now. evidence, and he was thinking that um, the shot was about 135 degrees relative to the ground, and maybe plus or minus five degrees, and that he took a height for Paul's shoulder, about four foot seven. He was going between a couple of data points that he had. And so he had uh, four foot seven. And then um, what you have to consider is, is that basically that's 90 degrees. And then so 135 is here. It's, it's 90 plus 45. So it's a 45 degree angle into the shoulder. But the consideration was is that they didn't see any stippling on Paul's shoulder. So you have to back the weapon up. And um, typically, you have to back that thing you're up. looking at three foot or less for stippling. He, he opined that, well, maybe it was two feet because it wouldn't work out. And the reason it wouldn't work out, if you back up a normal size shotgun three feet to get no stippling, it puts the butt of the gun under the concrete or through the concrete. Exactly. So, of course, that wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. So he had to adjust the distance for stippling right he said well maybe maybe you know it didn't work out that way so maybe maybe the stip maybe two feet um 
The correct way to do that, of course, though, would be to test the shotgun and or the ammunition at least, because we don't have the shotgun, but test the ammunition. Does it cause stippling at three feet or two feet? Um, that would be the correct way to do that. But if you take three feet of stippling, which is what um, the state medical examin examiner, Ms. Reimer, testified to, if you take three feet in a normal size shotgun, that 135 doesn't work because the butt of the gun will be into the concrete, or, you know, below the, below the ground. And I think we may have, he and I may have demonstrated that with a little red dot. Which yes, you did goes so much to how okay. there's variance so, in this, because obviously um, he was shot, obviously he was shot at some trajectory, and obviously the gun wasn't under the concrete, with so. With a normal size shotgun. What's theoretical um, and, and what actually happened? Dr. Um, Three have feet. some variance. Any, for there not to be stippling, it'd have to be three feet or further. Correct. Correct. It doesn't work out dimensionally. Okay. So. Stippling, stippling. Now, <clears throat> tell us about the stippling. The stippling and, does not lie. Briefly as possible. Oh, they didn't talk okay, about so, the um, second shot. I was asked a question, which is, if not a much. person is in the main house, would they be able to hear gunshots at the kennels? And so the way that you do this is you do acoustical testing, and I could spend a long time talking about this. Please don't. But you guys probably don't want to hear all of this. Accurate. But let me just tell you in general Good self how this is done. So what happens is, is um, when you have uh, a gunshot, is impulsive noise. It's very quick. It's gunshot probably only lasts about 10 milliseconds. That they it's very didn't loud. Talk um, much about the second shot. The threshold of pain fit. is about 140 decibels. Now, when you move 10 decibels, like 140 to 150, it's twice as loud. So you'll see what I recorded these weapons with a special instrument, um, and you'll see how loud they are. And the idea is, is that will the sound attenuate, decrease enough when it reaches the house? And there are a lot of considerations I considered. There's a little Wind. grove of trees. You, have, you don't have a hard reflecting surface. It's pasture and trees and sand. Um, you also have a, a, a well-built house double pane windows, um, wood paneling. So uh, it's going to have at least a normal, um, a normal, sound attenu or normal sound attenuation properties. In other words, you know, if you shut all your windows, you shut all your doors, there's a noise outside, depending on how loud that is, you may not hear it. So what I did was I set up testing. It's, it's, it's the same testing. It's called military standard uh, 1474 that um, the military has, has concerns about soldiers firing weapons and causing hearing damage. That's fair. They want to know how often can we send them to the range or what kind of hearing protection, how many rounds can they fire in a day, that sort of thing. They so I just set up Blanca the testing. They asked if she could hear and in from a the nutshell, house, I think. The, uh, the blackout rifle, we, we got an exemplar blackout, same ammunition involved in this case. We got 12 gauge shotgun. We got bird shot. We got um, buck shot. Uh, basically, the shotgun is around 155 dB. dB is? Is decibel. Okay. And when we measure sound, it's not on a regular scale. And the reason is, is because we can, we can hear, the threshold of human hearing is very, very minor. Um, and then we can hear loud noises like a rock concert. So if it was like a speedometer, your speedometer would have to go to like zero to a million. It's not practical, so we make it a log scale. And all, and all you really need to take away from that is, is that if you have something, a sound that's 50 dB, 60 dB is twice as loud. That's how we perceive it, if you have normal hearing. And then the, the idea is, is that, like the background in the courtroom here, there's a little bit of noise going on. But Not when on these microphones, quiet, it's, it's a probably lot. maybe 45 dB in here. It's a lot of noise. Right? So if a sound is 55 dB, we're all going to hear it, no problem. If a sound is like 45 dB, we may not hear it at all unless we're really listening for it. Or if it's a really quiet sound like 25 decibels or 30 decibels, we would never hear it. It's just the same thing as um, you could be at a rock concert and the person beside you is trying to talk to you and you can't hear them, <laughs> even though they're talking in a normal voice. You just can't hear them because your background is too high. You know, they're talking in a voice like I am without the microphone. My friends and I totally talk at rock concerts. But your rock concert's Normally 110 sing. dB, right? So all we're doing here is we're comparing sound. I did the testing and also um, went back and just used the theoretical calculations for the propagation of sound. 
to make sure that my results, which I took on January the 5th of this year, were the same as the results that you would have gotten if you would have done the testing on June the 7th, 2021. How? You have to take into account humidity, temperature, uh, wind, pressure, the wind direction, those types of things. So I did that. So what does this slide depict? So that's an overhead shot of Moselle from the center of the dog kennels, the, the area where all the evidence is, to the center of the house, the main house at Moselle. It's um, 1,142 feet, so 1,142 feet. Okay. But, um, as the crow flies. As the crow flies. Okay. Next. And this is looking past the dog house Pascal, to the kennels. It's a very fair yes, point. Yes, uh, so you're looking towards the kennels. The, the door on uh, no, the right end of the kennels is the feed room. That's, that's the area. It is the uh, thing I've been saving Paul's for these slow days body of trial. Was found. Salted caramel. And then the dog house is there. Delicious. What I'm showing here is, is that Delicious. there is, there is a, a backdrop to this area, which is vegetation and trees that have grown for reasonably close distances we know that you have the, to take into account the vegetation the, the, trees. This at longer distances grown. the sound can carry because the sound when i when i shoot the gun the sound is going to expand like you're blowing up a bubble right it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger but the bigger that bubble gets the weaker it gets just like the sound okay. and and eventually it goes away next what does this depict that's looking back towards the house to show you can't see the house here um, but that's looking straight back towards the house to show that if you were going to do some calculations you have to take into account there there is a a barrier of trees in the way okay next all right what is this device all right that is a sound pressure level meter and it's a it's a type one which is a high precision um, normally when you're recording sound sound is somewhat continuous and you can use a high grade meter. This is a special meter that's designed to capture gunshots because um, you're talking um, you know, 20 microseconds, thousands of a second, the rise of that pressure wave of shooting a gun. So you have both the gases escaping from the gun and you have the sonic boom of the bullet leaving the gun. So it's complex sonic noise. Boom. Um, and you have to have a meter that, can, that is fast enough to catch it and that's, that's what, what that, that is. meter is. Yes. Next. What is that? Uh, that's a little weather station I had, so I was recording the weather before and after the testing because I knew that I was going to go back and pull the weather history for the night of the murders and just see what kind of correction factors needed to be applied to my testing. Just curiosity, if the humidity was high that night but low then, how do you, what do we, how do you adjust that? Um, well, I'm actually curious there are too. charts and tables. It's just standard okay. conversion, right? Okay. The, and the humidity was higher in June than it was when I did it in January. The temperature was about the same. Humidity was different. But you've got temperature really? charge calculations. Temperature same in January as Physics, June. Really. It's For the humidity, results of this, all of, these, all of these modifications or adjustments that you would make really don't make a difference because what? The, the, the results were, were so far apart. Like what you would have to have to be able to hear a gunshot inside the house. It really didn't matter. You didn't have to make the corrections for temperature and stuff okay. that I did anyway. That, you didn't have to make the corrections. Why? That just shows where you had um, that instrument set up. Next. Again, picture where the instrument set up. Next. So why do you have a uh, measuring? You didn't there? have to make the corrections so what, for what sound. You're doing in, so I, I took a piece of dental floss, tied it to the muzzle, and then anchored it so Dr. that B, I knew I've that got the muzzle was, was one meter, it's a little over a yard from the microphone. And the reason you do that is, is that, so you fire this gun and let's say it's 165 dB. So for every doubling a distance, it's going to lose six dB, six decibels. So at one, one meter, it's 165. At two meters, it's going to be 159. At four meters, it's going to be 153, and so on and so on, because every doubling of distance, that's theoretical. Then you have to add correction factors, but that's but basically what to happens. ensure that your response is, you're recording your calculations as accurate as possible. Correct. I'm just following the MIL standard here. Okay. Uh, what standard? It's a mili oh, United military States standard. military yeah, standard. Yeah, you talked yes. about before. Okay, next. He's just following the MIL standard. That would be the ammunition you used? 
these slides are just showing what I used to do the testing. So this is the 300 blackout. Next. Is that a 300 blackout? Sure. Um, yes. Bullet? Okay, next. That would be the 300 blackout? Yes. Next. That would be the shotgun? Yes. 12 gauge? Yes. Okay, next. Uh, that would be the buckshot you used? Yes. Next. Okay, and that would be the bird shot, the turkey load bird shot? Yes. You used, right? Yes. Next. And this is uh, the inside of the house? That's the inside the den of the house, and what That's I did there word. was um, I took background readings. In the quiet house, it's really quiet because you're way out in the country there. I um, mean, there's no traffic. That is so not what I expected the inside to look like. I don't think I've ever seen the inside. In house, which is equivalent to, say, a quiet bedroom. Yeah, the night. air conditioning on? Because the outside is very um, I believe kind of the modern, was, white was farmhouse. Working. The inside the refrigerator is was running, wood. But it was very quiet. Okay. Um, and then so what I did was I set up some equipment there to measure the background. We also, of course, we turned on the TV to normal volume. So that's up around 68 dB, 70 dB, um, you know, depending on how, how you want to listen to you. We put a movie in. And okay. I ju just had that. So two background levels in the house. And then you, the next question is, when, when you fire a gun at the kennels, do you hear it? Do you not hear it? How loud is it? OK, next. So what is that? Well, I we did. We shot the, the blackout out around the doghouse. And then we shot the shotgun into the feed room, out of the feed room, and then with the muzzle outside the feed room. So we shot into the feed room, we shot out of the feed. So we're just trying to figure out, is there anything about the shape of the feed room that really changes the, um, really changes the character of the shot? The takeaway is, is, yes, it muffles the sound if you shoot into the feed room. It's not hard to understand. But the blackout was much louder than the shotgun. And it was shot over by the doghouse, where the shell casing was found? Yes. OK. And that is what you shot in the feed room? Yes, it's a ballistic gel dummy. It gave us something to shoot into. OK. Next. They did a lot of testing. I'm not quite sure what that is. It's just more, just pictures just showing the testing. OK. Same. OK, next. And um, this is the various indoor noise charts. sound levels. And could you, rather than reading all of this, could you sort of give us an overview of well, we appreciate uh, an overview of those shots you made? No, this is just actually um, just from the literature. If there was a discussion about different decibel levels, but you know, um, you know, vacuum cleaner 70 decibels. Oh, okay. Yeah, quiet conversation 55. A dishwasher in the next room is 50. You know, and on and on, you know, from, okay. you know, loud noises to soft right. noises. Next. I think that's just a, a blow up at the last slide. Okay. So what does all that mean? Uh, th just as a comparison to my numbers, these are, these are other people's test numbers, basically done the same way I did it. And you have a bunch of rifles and they're between, you know, you have 166 decibels. 163, 161, and there, therefore. So basically your rifle all the way down to a 22, which is sound. like 143 decibel. So but the average if you're, sound. If you're shooting a rifle um, with a decent size cartridge, okay. then you're looking at something from 160 to 165 dB. OK, next. This is a similar chart of other people's work okay. doing the same thing, and for shotguns. And basically, your shotguns are going to be 150 to 160 dB, so the not as loud quieter, as the rifle. The quieter, a little shotgun. bit quieter, but obviously, 12 gauge still is, is a loud gun. Uh, next. OK, here's your results. These are my results. So basically, the blackout was right at 165 dB, mm -hmm. and the shotgun was at 155 dB. So the results that I got from the testing were in line with uh, testing that other, other people, people have done. They're trying to okay. show yeah. the jury that the assumption that if okay, you so should have heard them, I'm going to turn this down a little, you should have heard them. You want us to play this? Because they're going to play the gunshot. Sure. Go ahead. What, what, wait a second. What is this? This is an audio file. Um, they're trying like to um, but what prove to the jury to that he could have been across. asleep and not and heard it. The bottom line. And trying to rebut Ooh. that this he must have heard it because he was. 300 blackout. There. Uh, fired in the loudest direction, 
because we tried north, south, east, west. But this is fired in the loudest direction. I'm sitting in the den. The doors and windows are shut. TV's not on, so it's as quiet as it possibly can be. And I'm sitting there listening for the shot. But you can gauge the sound of the shot. And I'm, I got a microphone now, but I, you know, I'm talking on this audio recording the same way I'm talking right now. Play it, please. Okay, I'm ready. Um, I'm going to give you a countdown and then you let Michael shoot and then go ahead and mute your phone, please. Three, two, one, shoot. All right, stand by. <clears throat> so okay, it, it was about uh, one second before I said, all right. So you could barely hear it. I we heard it. It's a very it. paint pop. Um, so if you were in the house, even if you were walking around, you wouldn't hear that. I could barely hear it, and I was listening for it. So what that tells you is that the sound inside the house they wouldn't have heard um, it. is right at, right at that background level. It's kind of sitting right in your background of the quiet house. And so... There was a if, shot. If you were doing any, any kind of activities inside the house, you wouldn't hear it. And certainly if you had the TV on, which will be, remember 10 dB is twice as loud. So it's 35 if you've got the TV on, there's no way you could hear that shot. So do you have a, a uh, engineering professional acoustical opinion, more probably than not, as to whether somebody in that house, without the TV on. You're not assuming with, someone's in the house. Uh, would hear that, um, those, those shots, those uh, black eye shots down at the dog pen. I do. And what is it? You would not be able to hear it. And the shotgun, I assume, is quieter, so it'd be even less of an opportunity to hear that. Open a yeah. door. And there were times we fired the shotgun in a Open quiet a house window. and didn't hear it at all. But it goes to argue and allow the jury to decide would he have heard it. This is to I think there's some more slides, but I think we've covered the acoustics, unless you want to get more. Well, I don't, I don't, I this is to counteract the, but wouldn't he have heard the shots? Wouldn't he have heard the shots? Because that's what we're all thinking. Keep going. But Keep they're going. assuming he's at the house, not Keep walking going. back to the house. Keep going. <clears throat> so what's it sound like That's outside? Because no. if they're shot at 849 and um, he's walking back to the house, then I'd like to offer into evidence a printout of that. Because if the jury thinks he's not inside, the jury doesn't yeah, care. Yeah. If the jury thinks he is inside, then they think he didn't do it, and it probably doesn't matter anyway. So This would be exhibit number... But if the jury thinks he's up at the kennels and then those shots happen right after he's at the kennels, then they're like, well, he's not in the house. What's it sound like outside? So then it doesn't matter. They're like, okay, well, you proved to me that inside the house is soundproofed or had been soundproofed sometime in the 18 months since the shooting happened. But, you know, assuming he's outside getting back to the house, then it's different. Okay, now let's go to one last matter. And you indicated you've done accident reconstruction. One last yes. matter. And I have a number of questions about why. This is, I guess, all mostly physics. Um, but let me ask you you've seen this document before. I'm not quite sure what this is. I'm interested. You recognize that? Yes. Okay, don't tell me what it is yet. Natalie Lawyer it's it's like, if only it wasn't for the pesky kennel, right? Because if the jury assumes he was at the kennel, which I think has been proven, and if the jury takes the prosecution's timeline, then he's outside going back to the house when these shots are done. And if they didn't test it, what it sounds like outside, then the jury might just disregard it entirely. But if the jury thinks he's inside sleeping, they already don't believe the prosecution, and then this doesn't matter. So it kind of, I think they had to do it, but I also think it's probably uh, not, I don't know how helpful this will be to the jury. Cause I don't know if it proves what they think either way. Um, any objection? Just, just a question. <laughs> so, so um, again. 
This graph would create under your supervision? Yes. Okay. And then there's another one, which is 142. Yeah, Natalie Lawyerchick, did you see Poot pointing the gun seemingly towards the prosecution table and saying tempting? Did you see that? That was a moment yeah. right when we came back from lunch. So we'd offer 141 and 142 into evidence. Any objections? No objections. They're admitted. So. Rob, I agree with you. If they think it's if they think the timeline's later though. If they think the timeline's later, they probably, then they're thinking he's at the house or at the house getting ready to go to his mom's. And that's the problem is he lied about napping. So but I agree with 141 you. is speed from Moselle to Almeida. Which I guess maybe I need, we don't have that on um, computer, do we? No. Oh, Poot actually said that, the, Pancakes. Uh, Let's start with 141. That happened. The prosecution didn't say anything. I went. Can I have the <gasps> Creighton, Creighton held his own. Or held his shit and didn't say anything. I think they should put it on the record at the break, though. And <clears throat> so most what bailiffs would have tackled them. Uh, this is a graph of the speed of Mr. Murdoch's Suburban, and this is from the trip from Moselle to his parents' house. And that would be on the night of June 7th? Yes, and each one of those little vertical lines, the blue lines, represents three seconds. Okay. So, um, two things. Um, we look at... 141, and you look at the time. <laughs> so this is the speed graph. Has What's Mr. he doing Monroe right down here? Home. Wait, what about those dips? Dip a dip? What's happening in the dip? Do we have a time? Where's the well, time? Actually, at the, the, bottom? the one that you've got up is the, um, is the return trip, I believe. This witness was was it uh, was qualified as an expert in three categories, and the prosecution had no objection to it. So yes, he is an expert in at least three things. But it seems like accident reconstruction is what he does the most. But I'm not sure where this is going. But okay, now I'm starting to get cold. So just chewing on ice to try to stay awake. That better? Yes, that's the that that's 141 there. Right, and at 9:07, has he left left Moselle? There aren't any times on this chart. We independently checked the data behind this to determine <laughs> where he was at 9:07. Yes. Where was he? Uh, on the chart. Yes, he it would is. Be, it's physics. Um, that first rise there. Yeah. Physics. There's a little bit of a dip, but then it, it rises all the way up. Um, I'm going to live in this car again for the there. rest of this trial. It's right way. before the dip in the middle. The dip in the middle is when he sent a text message. So just slight slowing <laughs> back over. <laughs> he back, was back, texting back. while driving, so here's right the dip. So 907 is going to be right before you get to that dip. What's that other dip? What's that? What are these other dips? I have some questions. I have questions about the other dips. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I, got di I got questions. What are the other dips? Poot, we have questions about the dips. dip a doo Poot, Poot, go back to the dips. So um, this graph starts at 9.07, does it not? <sighs> yes. Okay. So it means that he is in Moselle at 9.07? Yes. Okay. Um, questions are confusing. After he leaves there. Um, Was that snark? Does, he just does said questions are confusing. Down? Was that snark? I mean, after he turns onto the Moselle Highway, does he slow down? Ooh, buffalo any, chicken dip, Bethany. Any, any point until minutes down the road. Not until he's down the road. He's, this he's should have speed. times on the when bottom. he passes that, what you just asked, the cell phone location, he's passing uh, through the mid 40s. Times down here. Didn't slow down at the, at the um, at where, the, where Maggie's cell phone is on the side of the road. How do you know Correct. where it is? 
with, with that chart accelerating a little bit as he went through there just like i think 42 to 44 your pen's like covering up the shit i want to see though is that about right the objection was sustained okay there's so no terms on the past, chart i think you justified that there's no correlation to anything thrown out on the side of the road tell us approximately what he was doing was he accelerating decelerating stopping what was he doing he was speeding up so he's speeding up from you know 42 43 44 45 miles per hour as he goes through that area any indication he stopped or slowed down no okay now um <coughs> so you study physics, or you actually testify about physics. Um, if someone What's was throwing physics? a phone from a moving vehicle. Oh, now he's a physics ex expert as well. Wait, are you going to give him a phone to hurl? Whose phone's getting hurled? Into, Wh which I believe you went down and looked at the area where the <laughs> Vegas phone was found, right? Yes. All right. Would there be any. Uh, describe Council's me getting the ready to object. Of that. Objection beyond the scope of expertise. It is beyond the scope. Beyond the scope of what? Couldn't hear your objection. Objection beyond the scope of his expertise. Uh -huh. Response? Yes, sir. He is a mechanical engineer. We're talking about a mechanical <laughs> motion. Um, he's it's done mechanical, acid reconstructions where they have to determine the motions of certain objects during that wreck. Um, What's perhaps mechanical? Perhaps I could even ask him, are you confident you can give us an expert opinion on how a moving object would move uh, if thrown from a moving car. That's not how that works. That's okay. not how that works, Poot. <laughs> Look, the faces um, of the prosecutors are killing me right now. Now, you've like, also done um, matters is just a like, number of crime scene stop photos. Stop it. Correct. Yes. And you um, understand where Maggie's body was? Yes. And you understand where Paul's body was? Yes. Uh, would a vehicle, first of all, tell me the uh, typical headlights, the headlights on a Suburban, how far out would they go? How far out would you be able to see? With what? Uh, well, it depends on the object that yeah. you're looking Doesn't at. Doesn't it though. depend? Low beams, modern low beams, which would low be beams. on you. Um, you're going to be able to see about 250 feet in front of the vehicle along the ground. And what about the, the, the uh, width of the vision? Yeah, there'll, there'll be a spread out to the side as the headlight beam pattern bends around it, maybe 20 feet or so on either side of the vehicle. Depends on whether it's the left or the right. Um, you didn't ask him what year the, the suburban the was. on the ground, but you didn't yes, the, ask him if it had the pause attraction. I object. Would be well lit. Do the headlights and, have uh, pause I attraction? We saw the suburban's placement. Um, in the photos after uh, the police officers arrived, correct? Well, yeah, I have seen the photographs and I also have seen the path that the Suburban took by the GPS points as it drove up to the kennels. And based on those, do you have an opinion as to whether or not Alec Murdaugh, who was, if he was driving that vehicle, would have been Objection. able to see? Yep. Beyond the scope of his expertise? Yep. I need told. to hear the complete question before entertaining an objection. <laughs> Based he, on your he doesn't want the question the to get out because it suggests on a motor vehicle. The testimony. Do you ever look at that in terms of um, uh, motor vehicle accidents? That Judge you Newman is done. I look at it all the time. Car pedestrian accidents. It's, okay. it's a well-known area of study in my field. So, would you have to be able to give an opinion as to what someone would be able to see with their headlights? Yes. You no, do it all the time. you can't yes. say what they could see. You could say so what the headlights would cover. To a degree of mechanical engineering, more probably than not, whether Alec Murdoch would have been able to see Council's like, Paul and Maggie's bodies as he pulled up. getting ready. Objection. Calls for speculation beyond the scope and no foundation laid for that line of question. I sustain the objection. Poot looks confused. Okay. You have looked at the photographs of the scene. They're going right. to fight yes. on this one. You looked at the GPS data to see where that vehicle pulled initially, right? They're yes. going to fight. I'm talking about the Suburban. Fight. You fight. routinely fight. take that same data in a mechanical, and, and not a mechanical, in a motor vehicle accident. You've been qualified to testify about motor vehicle, motor vehicle accidents. They agreed to that. Tell me, would 
someone driving that vehicle been able to see in their headlights the bodies of Paul and Maggie at that GPS location? Again, I'm, I'm going to object, Your Honor. Same thing. Calls for speculation. I overrule the objection. Go ahead. Uh, yes, they would, they would definitely be available to be seen. I can't say what Mr. Murdoch saw, but you're talking about objects that are maybe 25 feet in front of this suburban and directly in front of this suburban with low beam headlights on flat level ground. It would illuminate the whole area under the shed, between the shed and the kennels and the kennels. So um, his headlights would definitely illuminate that area. Thank you, Carson. And they're asking that because of how fast in time Alec drives up based on the GPS points to when Alec calls 911. The prosecution's going to argue, well, the reason he called 911 so fast, he didn't run over and check anybody. He knew they were dead because he shot them. And the defense is trying to get to, no, no, no. He saw with the headlights on where the bodies were. And because he saw that, he was able to determine in your that they were dead. Career, and that's how he called so fast. In investigating motor vehicle accidents, have you ever had the opportunity to um, look at good how objects behave if they are thrown from or broken oh, off he's from trying again. the motor vehicle. That Barber's you're like, we're not giving up. Sure. Um, the most common thing is, say, a, a motorcycle rider who hits a car and flies through the air. So there are ways that you can analyze it. Sadly, we're all too common. Say an object flying through the air at a certain speed, what happens but when that object But a phone and a person are two very um, the different other thing things. that you see, like objects coming off trucks. Unfortunately, things come off trucks all the time. But that's when they're... They bounce on the highway they're not or thrown. fall off and they go through people's windshields so it's it's simple ballistics it's they, uh straightforward that's not ballistics um, kinematics of maybe objects moving through some sort of a, a trajectory they really want to get into this also what happens once they strike the ground how do they slow down of course it depends on the surface but you know how does an object slow down that a phone wouldn't once just it's flying through the air stop. like if it if, would if a rock comes tumble. off a dump truck and the dump truck's going 55 when the rock hits the ground it's going to be going 55 so it's not just going to stop it's going to continue traveling until it rolls and tumbles and slows down let me get back to a question that is an object this size the size of my cell phone yeah, if it object separated again. Separated from the vehicle, thrown, fell off, or whatever, on a car that's going whatever the speed limit there, 45 miles an hour, um, and it's it it it, it headed head over to where you saw Maggie's phone found. Would it rotate more than 45 Improper degrees? Improper hypothetical. In the air? Objection. Speculation. No foundation laid. Outside. Expertise. He has studied this. This is what he does. He studied according to what no, was seen being not in dispute by the state, uh, since he was no challenge to his uh, qualifications <laughs> in any of the areas that you offered him, him in. Uh, the question is whether this calls for speculation. Are you speculating, or is this based on years of study and and uh, uh, physics? I mean, what you do. Uh, no, it's, it would be based on physics. But did you actually do a physical <coughs> examination of the... Permission to approach? Permission to approach? <coughs> approach? Let's all stand for a moment. Yes, you can come forward. Ah, they're going to do a sidebar. Here's the thing. The prosecution should have objected when they offered some of the expertise... The judge was very annoyed with some of the prosecutors, um, some of the prosecutor's objections earlier. They're going to approach the bench and he's going to explain why he's upset. Now, with that, the prosecution is objecting to this witness speculating on what a phone would have done if yeeted from a vehicle at that speed. But they haven't laid the foundation for that well. However, they did admit him as an accident reconstruction expert. The prosecution was like, no objection. And the court's like, y'all didn't object. If y'all didn't object, why are you objecting now? It's not outside the scope of his expertise. They admitted him as an expert in like four different things. So what I think he's gonna try to get to is if a phone was yeeted from a high rate of speed, it wouldn't just be laying pleasantly in the grass. It would have tumbled or bounced. It would have had grass all up in its undercarriage and shit like that. So we'll see what the court has to say and what the next questions are. Okay, I, let me see if I can ask this in a very concise way, and then I promise I will sit down. Lies. So you, objects 
moving from a moving vehicle or even a I mean, moving vehicle like something this size, if it's going through the air and the car is going 45 miles an hour, will it tumble, unless it's a spherical object, will it tumble? Well, it depends on how it's separated, like you said, from the it car or depends. thrown from the car. However it gets away from the car, you need to know that before you know what it's going to do in the air. But the one thing's for sure, it's going to hit the ground at 45 miles per hour, which is 66 feet per second. So as soon as the phone, phone hits the ground, it's going to want to come to a stop, right? So that phone will tumble and slide. If it was just like grass, just like flat grass, it's going to go about 115 to 120 feet. That's how long it's going to take that phone to slow down from 45 miles per hour. In the area where the phone came out, though, there's like some saplings and brush and pine straw. I doubt it went that far, but it, it would, it would definitely was disturbed near the know, phone tumble the through the, the edge of the woods there. Tilt more than 45 degrees? Sure. Um, it didn't look like anything was one, disturbed one, in those um, photos. And that's and what they're getting at. Tumble. The phone it looks. Would tumble, correct? It moved. Also, the phone was off, so that tumble yes, wouldn't that's necessarily what's happen to be a, recorded. To an, you know, it doesn't have to be a phone, but any, any object. a brick or anything like that is going to roll and tumble. They should Maybe have called if, him if in the, the surface Stephen is Smith uh, flat enough, it might even slide. One last question. I, I, one line. I just forgot this. Um, you looked at the data on the speed data on um, the suburban returning on the night of the seventh from Almeda to Moselle, correct? Yes. And the state mentioned that there are a couple of times where his, or at least one time, where his speed goes up to 80, comes back down. Or t tell us what's happening with those peaks, the 70 and the 80. Well, if you look at Exhibit 142. Yeah. Um, this graph represents the speed, so the higher the peak, um, the higher the speed. The sharper the peak is the smaller amount of time that he spent at that speed. So like the one in the middle that goes so to 80 miles an hour. It would be if there was time on the bottom of the graph. Just a second or so, a couple seconds. I like a demonstrative, Because each one of those blue lines represents three seconds. So what that shows you is, is that he does reach high speeds on the return trip, but it's not for a long period of time. And that's why the, basically the average speed of Mr. Murdoch coming back to Moselle was about the same as what SLED drove it, right? Because you're not really changing the average speed that much because you're, you're driving faster, but just for little periods of time. Is that consistent with somebody passing a car? Uh, it could be. But it's just an up and down. It's not like yeah. 80 miles an hour all the this. way back to Moselle. That's correct. Right. That's if correct. you tossed it this way, it's different than if you tossed it this way. We're assuming the way it's tossed. Thank you can't assume indulgence. the way it's tossed. I beg everyone's indulgence. You said you would ask one concise question and sit down. Thank you. Liar! Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break now. Please do not discuss the case. The judge is so done. You could hear him snapping at the prosecution earlier, too. He is just done. This trial has gone far longer, which means it's going to fuck up this judge's entire calendar. Because, again, this judge has a bunch of other cases that are now going to get screwed because he's in this trial. So his calendar that was booked out on his court calendar for the next few weeks is going to get bumped and bumped and bumped. So this judge, this trial going over by a few weeks is going to screw up this judge's calendar for months to come. Judicial calendaring is such a difficult and delicate thing in the first place, but it is going to mess it up for quite a while. So um, I've just gotten distracted by Twitter I didn't know there were buffalo wing pretzel crisps. Thank you, Amanda Bell, for, for tagging me in that. I appreciate it. I was looking at um I was looking at the debate on Twitter about the quote tweet versus the retweet um going on with Jim Jim Griffin. I think we're very clear that it was a retweet. I'm gonna get to some questions. But first we're gonna stretch. We're gonna stretch. I need a stretch. Oh, y'all need a stretch. I've got my Control F Yourself shirt on today. The new cardigan. It is now a part of my uniform. It is so comfy. Penelope's Lane said, my dad and I are obsessed with this trial. 
This weekend, we took an old iPhone and tried to throw it out of a car to the other side of the road from a passenger seat. I bet my dad it was impossible. I won $100. So it sounds like it was impossible if you won, if you bet it was impossible. However, it's going to be much harder if there is a passenger in the passenger seat. Um, because the timing only works that way. I think the phone, I think the defense makes very good points with regard to the phone and the timing of the phone. I truly do. What I don't understand is why AM felt the need to erase the calls on his phone. Um, why all lies about everything? I, I don't know, but also to just counterpoint that for a second, he had given his phone to sled on June 10th and they had done a partial dump of the phone. So I don't know. Could judge Newman have yeeted Jim this morning over the tweeting? Allison, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it would be, I think it would cause more problems. He admonished Jim and that was about it. And that's appropriate. Um, I think also that after admonishing Jim, the prosecution didn't bring it up at all. I mean, today, hold on, let's go back. Can we go back to the moment we're doing it? We're, we're just doing it. I'm asking, I beg the chat's indulgence. I beg the chat's indulgence. I need to go back to right when we came back from lunch and Poot is messing around with a 300 blackout because I am still not over the fact that it seemed like what that Poot dealing with the 300 blackout. I want to see the reaction at the prosecution table as Poot's doing this. So I'm going to back up to Poot taking the 300 blackout out of the box. I'm going to go to our, the three, uh, the three camera split over on law and crime. And let's take a look at this. Cause I really need to see, um, I, I want to see the prosecution table reaction if we can see that. So we're going to do that real quick because I'm still just like, what it happened very fast. This afternoon after lunch, Poot was picking up the 300 blackout and he was trying to maneuver it around the courtroom so he wasn't pointing it at anyone, but it seemed that he was pointing it in the direction of the prosecution table and said, tempting. And there was a chuckle. And I can't tell if the chuckle was from the audience or the jury because we only had the one feed up. Now we have three feeds up and we can go ahead and take a look. Hopefully this will be loud enough and let's see. Definitely loud. Do you recognize this? Do you know what this is? Yes. What is it? Uh, it's the, uh, I think it's a, you know, like an exemplar 300 blackout. Sorry, it's so rifle. peaky. Um, and this is the weapon, a weapon like this, that the shooter would have had. Yes. Okay, so <coughs> I'm trying to sort of get a visual of. I'm going to come down here so I don't point at you. So I don't point at you. Come down here so I don't point at you. Maybe, let me come up there and come this way. Okay. And then he point turns around. Oh, place. we're at a single camera. Darn it. Points it. So I'm not five foot two or five foot four. I think he's five foot three or five foot four. But position me. <laughs> Tempting, but. um. It's worse. It's worse on the rewatch because you see him start to chuckle, but it looks like Metters and the other prosecutors also laugh. So look, Metters is laughing. Metters is laughing. Metters is also laughing. And it looks like the audience starts to chuckle. I'm going, I don't know what in the Elmer Fudd is fucking happening in this courtroom. I'm just going back five seconds. I will tell you what, if a defense attorney ever or pointed a weapon at me in court and said tempting i would have lost my ever loving fucking mind but now that we've got the three camera feed it looks like the prosecutors are laughing so where the f what the what is happening all right we're gonna watch it again because it's not that he just see we didn't know what was coming the last time it's not that he just says tempting it's the glee that lights up his face in advance of him saying tempting. Creighton's definitely not laughing. Oh no, Creighton definitely doesn't look like he's laughing. But I couldn't, uh, there's no way. But also, you, uh, 
Yep. You don't point weapons at opposing counsel in court. All right, let's look again. But four, I think you should have to do four. But position me. Look, look at his face. Tempting, but um, <laughs> I don't know how I can do this. It's the courtroom that laughs. You can see the gallery back here laughing as he's saying tempting. <sighs> Somebody make Runkle react to this clip, but I don't know what's happening. They all they all just kind of giggled. I okay. I don't like it, but it's just me. They all just kind of giggled. And Metters and and the prosecutor sitting next to him, oh over here, laughed along with it. So I, uh, I'm just going to do it one more time. I just, I, I, I can't believe this happened in court. I really can't. But then again, the coroner measured time of death by putting his hands in people's armpits. So just. So I'm not five foot two or five foot four. I think you should five foot three or five foot four. But position me. Tempting, but um, <laughs> I don't know how I can do this. So I'm not pointing at something. Uh, okay, everybody seems good with it. So what? Who are we? We're just the we're just the TV audience at home because everybody else seems fine with it. That's wild, wild to me. Uh, things happen in court, and uh, you never know. It could have been nervous laughter. It could have happened so fast that they were just like, whatever. It's just a, it's an odd. I don't know how you, I don't know how that passes through your brain. And you're just like, this is the joke we're going to crack right now. That it's tempting to shoot the prosecution in a double homicide case in front of the jury. It just, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if there's any uh, reporting on it though. It'll be interesting to see if anyone talks about it. I wonder if um, Avery mentioned it in his Twitter thread. He might've, I haven't looked. All righty, let's go to your questions. It's just, I guess we're on a 15 minute break. That's so weird. Quick this. The wrong damn bumper, Emily. The great big geek said, why can't you hear a pigeon at a concert? acoustics <laughs> I'm tickled thank you that was that was fantastic that was fantastic um Alex got a full face smile out of that one I mean I'm sure I mean I'm sure I'm sure oh. he did not hear the shots at the house because he was at the kennel this is what most of the chat said was like okay well you can test at the house all the time but if the jury believes he was up at the kennel then um, it doesn't matter what he would have heard from the house. They don't give a shit. Love the new mug. Ordering mine soon. Question. Couldn't Jim think he was just retweeting since he didn't type anything in the tweet? He did type something in the tweet. It didn't say retweet with the symbol, but didn't write anything. He did write. He rewrote the title. There's actually. Hold on. Um, there. I just saw an experiment with this. Um, over on Twitter, let's see where it is. It was not just a straight, it was not just a straight retweet, um, because he had to put in the, he had to put in the, uh, he had to put in the text. So I'm fucking racking over on, over on the, the tweet tweets posted this experiment and said, Jim Griffin learned nothing from the Depp v. Heard case. I became curious and looked closer at Jim Griffin's claim. It was just a retweet. No, it wasn't. I know he tweeted from an Android, so I tried to tweet it from Chrome and Google, and no caption for the tweet emerged. So these are the experiments of if you try to share the article, you have to add a comment here, or, or if you don't add a comment, it'll just show the box of the Washington Post. And if you just, wait, this is the retweet of the Washington Post tweet. If you just try to share the article directly from the Washington Post website, you don't. And that's what I tried this morning. I tried to share the article directly from the Washington Post site, and it doesn't populate any text. It says opinion. Alex Murdoch trial reveals a sloppy investigation. So then the second photo shows the Washington Post, which is opinion 
by Kathleen Parker. Alex Murdoch trial reveals a sloppy investigation. Jim Griffin's tweet was not opinion by. It was just Alec Murdoch trial reveals a sloppy investigation. He had to type it in. It is not commentary. It is the title of the article, but it's also not the entire title of the article because the entire title says opinion in it. So it is absolutely, he added, he didn't add opinion, but it is in fact a quote tweet where he quote tweeted it and left off the opinion part. So, and the chat's like, why is it always the Washington Post? It's always the Washington Post. It's always the Washington Post. But that's, it's what it is, and they're leaving it go. So it is, in fact, a quote tweet. We, as an audience, the law nerds, know more about quote tweets than I ever thought I needed to know between a quote tweet and a retweet. But it's not a retweet. If you just go to retweet it, it just retweets it. So uh, Jim Griffin was not specifically accurate. And I don't know if he said it was a retweet or if he said I didn't say anything. Because technically, if he's just quoting the title, is he in fact saying anything? That might be a very narrowly parsed, a very narrowly parsed thing. It's just, it's not a great look. But then again, I don't think it was a great look for Tinsley to be donating to, to GoFundMes in the middle of trial either. It's just everything in this case has been wild. And I don't understand any of it. It's wild. It's all, everybody's like, eh. Eh. Um, and that's fine. Carrie Allen said, Emily, you don't understand Southern gun culture. That's, that's accurate. We all grow up with at least a shotgun and granddaddy's 22 in the closet. I have no problem with that at all. Um, it's the pointing the weapons at the prosecutors and then joking about it in open court in front of the jury that I have issue with. Um, it's just, it's, I don't think it's appropriate in the context of I don't think it's appropriate in the context of court. That's and that's again my opinion. I I the prosecution didn't object, the judge didn't say anything, the audience laughed. It doesn't sit well personally with me. Um and with a lot of you in the chat. So, it's uh it's just it's just wild stuff. Let's get back to some more questions while we while we still have court on a break. Wasn't AHJD about a retweet versus a quote tweet? Yes, that was a huge factor into whether or not it was publishing defamation and whether or not there was defamatory. Very, very clear in there that um, that Amber Heard had republished for me. Doesn't the sloppy sled job go towards the prosecution as well? No hard evidence because they screwed up. I think the sloppy sled, God, say that 10 times fast. I think the investigation cuts both ways because they're saying, oh, they just thought it was Alec and they would just pin it on him so they didn't investigate. And I think they thought it wasn't him, so they just didn't investigate. We'll see. Or they didn't want it to be him, so they're like, la, la, la. Or they were afraid of him. It's odd. Um, Gingy Prob says, basic feature of a graph, define the X, Y axis. Yep. It was really annoying that they didn't. Um, but at least they have demonstratives. I mean, they've had much more, they've had many more demonstratives and summary charts than the prosecution had, and it might make their theory more memorable to the prosecu to the jury because the prosecution didn't do summary charts and demonstratives in the same way. And so far, the um the defense has done a much better job in making their theory of the case clear much more clear than the prosecution did. Whether the prosecution will turn around and clean that up in their rebuttal case, we'll see. But the defense has made it easy to follow. They've made it easy to follow. So, a Guinness World Record for throwing a cell phone. <laughs> Steve, we appreciate you. Now we know. This is, this is more than I needed to know. More information than we needed it, and I'm here for it. I love it. Law nerds are the best research attorneys in the world. Guinness World Record for throwing a cell phone, 362 feet, 3 inches. But did they hurl it overhand, or did they, like, what mechanism of throne was it? Poot is so good in the good old boys club. Poot is well ensconced. 
What was the business about noise from the house? Isn't it established he was at the kennel? I think there's an argument that the prosecution's timeline is off and the defense is going to make that argument that the prosecution's timeline can't say when the murders occurred. So if the murders, he, Alec is proved, I think, proved to be at the kennels at 844 when that video is taken. After that point in time, there's an argument that the murders happened around 849, 850. That's the prosecution's argument because of when the cell phones go silent. The defense is pushing that timeline out. So if Alec left the kennels and got back to the house to get ready to go to his mom's house, which is not ever what he told law enforcement, but this is their theory or that what they're going to argue, he goes back to the house, get ready, gets ready to go see his mom's house. So he's inside the house at that time and doesn't hear it. If the murders are closer in time to when the prosecution says that they are, then wouldn't you have been outside and hear it? And that's really the fight over the timeline. And that's why the timeline matters so much. So that's why the timeline matters. The judge went and got himself a cup of tea, coffee, something. So that's why I think they're, they're pushing the argument and it just, what they're doing is giving the jurors that are on their side enough to argue. And I think they're doing that effectively at this point. Bring the jury. I think the defense means because the rush to judgment came after and because of a sloppy investigation, Sled botched a big case and then used AM as a scapegoat. Kimmy, I think that's a fair interpretation. Leslie Ann said, what in the world? Southern born and bred, my daddy taught me. You never point a gun at anyone unless you intend to pull the trigger. Poot owes the prosecution and the court an apology. I don't think that's going to happen. Everybody just kind of chuckled and moved on. Weird. It's not appropriate in court because it completely minimizes the danger of these weapons and the death of these people. I mean, have we all learned nothing? iPhone Frisbee style throw. I think that's the best way to go farther. Cindy Lynn, you are so funny. What in the Elmer fun? I'll be using that one. What is, what is happening? The woman adjusting her scarf nervously. Who is that on the defense team? I'm curious. If you ignore gun in his hand and listen to what he says, but position me, tempting. The jury is present, sir. I think he was referring to making a dirty joke out of positioning, not realizing how it looked to others. Maybe. I didn't take it that way at all. Um, but it's possible. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I wanted to begin by going over a few of your, your qualifications, you know, what we heard about kind of at the beginning of your testimony. Yay, cross-examination! <clears throat> is your practice um, focused primarily on, would you, would you agree your practice is kind of focused primarily on accident reconstruction? Would you agree? Here we go with cross. Construction? I would say so in failure analysis. And that would be in your advertisements online and, and your CV that you provided? Well, probably on a website, we really don't advertise, but definitely on my CV. The website. Right? Yes. <clears throat> and most of the uh, work you've done would have been in that field, the accident reconstruction or analyzing um, things to do with mostly civil litigation. Would that be fair to say? I would say, yes, that's fair. Most of the work that the company does company-wide is civil litigation. And so accident reconstruction, but that's a pretty broad description because, for instance, I have civil engineers, I have biomedical engineers, so they deal with a lot of different subject matters. Yeah. And primarily civil litigation, even though it's a broad area of civil litigation. Exactly. Very yes. good. And uh, you, your client today is the defense, is that correct? Yes. And you were uh, retained, retained by them. When were you retained? Uh, Jim Griffin called me I want to say it was about the middle of September of 2022. And I know we've seen your PowerPoint. Did you, um, is that your report or did you prepare a separate report for defense? The, the written report that I did in this case was on, was on the acoustics testing, but um, the PowerPoint was just trying to pull, you know, it's a big file, of course, but just trying to pull it all into one, one place. I wonder if that wasn't turned over. Did you provide over. any additional reports to count to defense, or did, was the PowerPoint the only one? Just the PowerPoint, and then I had maybe a four to five page report on the results of the acoustics testing. And when did you finalize your um, PowerPoint that we, we just uh, saw today? In its final form, that would have been yesterday. So you finalized your, your PowerPoint Yesterday. one day before your trial? Yes. Okay. Or for your testimony. Is that, is that standard for you to do? Yes. 
All right, and what's your, uh, how much are you getting paid for your services? So the company charges three fifty an hour for my time. And how many hours have you worked on this case? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> a lot. I, I couldn't give you an idea, but I, I made two trips down here. I've, I've been to Moselle twice. Um, I read through a bunch of documents. You know, studied pictures forever. Um, got ready for trial, of course. That took a while. I would probably say that I have, you know, somewhere between 40, 50 hours in this case. 40 to 50? Is that your think, estimate? I would think so. That doesn't seem wild. Everybody at the and council table is doing math. expenses, is that why you kind of mentioned it separately? It does, yes. Yeah, so, um, they pay for the yeah, travel. The company charges anytime I'm traveling or working. So Have you ever done addition. any work for the law firm formerly known as PMPED? Good question. Um, no. Um, I've had, because I've been doing this for so long. Cases um, against and them? And I do a lot of railroad cases. I w have been on the other side of that law firm, and I've been deposed. Like, oh, that's the interesting. Side, they took my deposition. <laughs> I was on the other side working for a defendant. But I've never worked for them directly, like on, a, like say, a personal injury case or a wreck case. Have you ever been retained by uh, to work on the boat case? Yes, I okay. did. Tell me about that. What were you? What was your retention for for the the boat case? And by the boat case, um, which one are you referring? Which one? What do you understand that to be? Oh, well, the boat case, the the, the Mall Mallory Beach case. So the the one that occurred down at Paris Island. So um, I do boat accidents. I do you know, oh. small vessel watercraft. Um, jet skis. I've actually worked on ship accident, ship collisions before. So I do a lot of a maritime and, and boat accident work. And I was called by Jim Griffin um, a few years ago. It would have been probably, you know, within a few months of that accident. And I did an investigation of the boat crash. Does your, sir, do your services also include a retainer like is there some sort of retainer to to work off of before the hourly billing kicks in no uh our company is, is pretty simple we just bill by the hour so we, we don't do contracts or retainers some people in my field of work do so you're originally retained by mr griffin for the boat case to do a boat reconstruction is that fair to say yes okay. uh -huh. and that would be in line with your you know what you primarily do with your services at the uh, at the um, your so he was retained to do a boat reconstruction yes, in the just civil falls case. underneath uh, physics mechanical engineering I anything based in physics can has the potential for being explained and that's for that's those what in I the do. chat that say it feels too interconnected all right and I know your educational asking. background is yes. in engineering that's, that's why they're correct. asking yes and uh, <clears throat> you know I want to talk about a few things we can maybe agree on uh, and engineering is a is a field that would you agree engineering is a field that, that That's is why the based prosecution in, asked. Um, science? Would yes. you agree with that? Yes. Would you agree that engineering is a field that's based in, in ma some math? Is that fair to say? There's a lot of math in engineering, yes. We, we heard a lot about trigonometry and angles. I mean, math, right? Yes. Engineering is based, uh, a lot of, uh, is, is based in um, hard facts. Would you agree with that? Yes. And uh, engineering, some of the things that really have no business in engineering would be guesswork. Is that fair to say? Well, in engineering, you can sometimes make assumptions and then make guesses, but you always have to go back and test them. That right? was you, loud. you develop what we Excuse call me? a hypothesis. How right? many decibels so was that? You look at the problem, you try to figure out what the problem is, you form a hypothesis. And then you test it. So you, know, you might say, well, I think this. And then you either mathematically or physically. Yeah, I like this it. prosecutor. What are Going the best Going back to that question about guesswork, though, because I don't know that you answered it. In engineering, <laughs> is it yep. important not to use guesswork in making opinions? Right. If I give an opinion, I'm not guessing. So whenever I give an opinion, there is a, yeah, he stays at the podium. a foundation based on my education, experience, and training for me to give that opinion. So if an opinion's rendered and there's variables that aren't considered, would that be, would you consider that to be guesswork? Well, it depends on how important the variables are. I mean, any engineer in, in, in any analysis procedure, you know, there could be lots of variables that don't matter. But if the variable matters, then of course, you know, that, that would affect your opinion. And in engineering, um, you know, and we're thinking of, I think you said you're a mechanical engineer? Yes. By trade, by uh, by education. Yes. So, do mechanical engineers engage in speculation? 
Um, not in the context of giving opinions. Okay. And do mechanical engineers, when they're, whatever Danger. they're engineering or whatever they're opining Danger. about, do they Danger. Uh, base their opinion on assumptions? Not primarily, not even really. Um, your opinions can't be based on assumptions. Okay. Now, Hypothesis. there can be Testing. aspects of your analysis that you have to test, but just but you know whether it's an assumption or a guess that does not make for a good engineering opinion. Appreciate that. Thank you. <clears throat> By are commentary. you a member of any? Okay, have you had any that. formal training in pathology? Here we go. No. Have you had any formal training in firearms or firearms um, how they how they work? No. Are you a member of any organizations um, that that do? that line of work, that, that do tests on firearms or, or pathology. If he, no. Is he going to ask if he's board certified? Are we getting there? These are good questions. Have you taken any shooting <clears throat> incident reconstruction classes? It's no. Probing his expertise. Do you have any certifications in shooting incident and reconstruction? No. Do you have any, have you taken any classes in gunshot wounds? No. Have you ever done any studies on bullet trajectory from uh, out of the muzzle of a gun? Yes. Okay. What studies have you done? I've done all kinds of testing. With, all right. Such with, as? For, for instance, um, one time I had a case, it was a murder case where a person was shot through a car door and uh, was shot with a 357 Magnum and the door had maybe six bullet holes and each of the bullet holes had different characteristics. So I went, so I went to the junkyard and got 25 to 30 of these doors and I spent a couple of weeks shooting that door with a 357 Magnum at different angles, different distances until I could replicate the bullet holes in the actual um, in the door. So what you're doing there is that you have a door as evidence and then you're trying to figure out okay what does that tell you? He's Not testing the same it. as what I talked about today but similar. Um, He's like, I just I've done, it. I had a case one time where there were two deer hunters in the woods and one got shot at long range. So we did a lot of um, was it the wild long boar? range ballistic testing of the ammunition in the firearm to determine the drop distance of the bullet and to understand where the one hunter would have to um, aim the weapon. I have done um, proximity testing with firearms. Um, by looking at the, the stippling. So in other words, I uh, have a rig that I can put a pistol in and then I put target, a lot of times I use sheetrock, and then what I do is I fire the gun at increments back and look at the pattern of the stippling. Sometimes you'll get soot and stippling and sometimes that. So it would all be testing within the context of the cases. You know, when I get involved in a firearms case, those are the types of things that, that T types of tests that I would do. It, it, it's just a general part of our business when we get presented with an engineering problem, we do testing. And those testing, any of those studies that you did, were they subject to peer review or published in any publication? No, I, I typically don't write papers or, or submit papers. I just, I do the work. So it's you doing a test on your own? Yes. Is that right? That's what it is? Yes, or with, you know, of course, people in my office help. With your office? Yes. Okay. And you're, are you a member of the International Association for Identifications? No. Firearms Identifications? No. Do you have any certifications along those lines whatsoever? No, I'm not a firearms expert or a pathologist or a wound expert. That's, that's not my area of physics. It's not my area of expertise. He's like, it's just physics, So is it fair man. to say then any opinion you rendered on relating to firearms, we, we shouldn't rely on it then? That's not what I said. Okay. If it's related to um, exterior ballistics and terminal ballistics, then yeah, you can it. certainly rely upon it. But I'm not going to testify about wounds or pathology or anything like that, and I haven't. Okay. All right, I want You're to not here to testify, really, that the shooter must have been the, uh, on the ground then, right? Start with um, the cell phone. I think we ended on the last slide. We ended the, on uh, yeeting the charts. phone. I don't know where those are. showing you defense exhibit 141 and 142. 
believe you testified. That you, can I have the PowerPoint? Oh, sorry. I believe you testified that you created these graphs. Is that right? Uh, no, I didn't. This is this is an Excel graph from the data. So it's just the raw data that 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 was presented to me. Oh, Kelly Bean, I'll answer this. We know the answer to that in evidence about the dog kennel oh, video. Who created it then? I'm from not sure. I, I just reviewed it. I'm not sure who did this. All right. Well, can you tell me? I think you testified. I've seen it. I only looked at the exterior Well, show photos. me the time, if you would, and, and permission for the witness to come down. Show me the time that you indicated the phone was thrown from the car, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> well, I got it specifically on my laptop. I can show you in general. It's up to you. I mean, well, I, we, we, this is an evidence, so I'm asking for you to come down and identify on here where it is. <laughs> you want to know where the car passed, where the phone was? Yes. Just for clarification, yeah, one second, sorry. Just for clarification, we're looking at this chart. What is this showing us? Oh, that that's real fuzzy. The speed of the suburban versus time. So speed is on the y-axis, or that's real this blurry. is speed, mm -hmm. there we and go. then that's time. So time's going that way. And as the car speeds up, the line gets taller. Speed, okay. time. And it says total time, 16 minutes. What does that refer to? That's the time it took to drive from Moselle to the parents' house. Okay, and the sled, and then the, it says next to that sled test drive during day. What does that indicate? Uh, what, um, what that is, is it's just comparing. It took 16 minutes, Mr. Murdoch, and then sled did it. Sled did the same drive not at night time but during the day and took 17.58 minutes okay chantelle's asking all right who's so as i was saying this? before i think you testified you said you, you indicated a point where Somehow? the cell phone had been thrown from um the vehicle or, or at least the time correlation could you please identify where that is for us no that's that's not what i said all right, well, what did you say then i said that um <laughs> when the car passes the location okay right I, yeah Sorry. i don't i don't have any information about when the car passes the location yes. where, where is it indicated on? um it's i think it's that line right there okay and you say you think why why is it that you think well it's not labeled but it's on my laptop i'd be glad to get my laptop. well it's not labeled well, this is an evidence and this is what the jury's going to consider no. so i, I prefer Laptop's to work on this. evidence objection he has indicated he has a specific data on his laptop. If he wants the real answer, he'll be happy to walk to his laptop and get it for him. Oh, that's he an inappropriate objection. That's where it is. That's a speaking objection. I mean, he's asked the question three times. He's got he's answered three times. Cross examination. You may proceed. Because it's cross examination. You're not able to find it on here, are you? Looking at this chart. Correct. Um, it's either this line right there. Uh, you don't know. It's this one or this one. All right. Does engineering engage in I thinks and maybes? Get my laptop. Well, I'm just asking you, can you identify it on this chart? Well, I mean, this is a really big file. Your Honor, I'd ask the witness, please answer the question. Well, I will answer it, but I don't have the whole file memorized, so let me just, let me just look at it for you. He didn't say you could review your file. Can you point it out on this chart without, without reviewing whatever you're about to review on your laptop? No. Okay. Can you identify 912 on this chart without, ident without reviewing anything you're about to review on your laptop? Well, I mean, you want me to answer the first question? You just, you answered you already it. You said, said no. Can you, can you identify where on 912 on this chart is? No, they're not. Okay. They're, it doesn't have any numbers written down. Thank you. Can you identify where 920 is on this chart? That's the point. Well, hold on. You want me to answer your questions? Or you want me to answer the first question? The questions, please. Can you identify where 920 is on this chart? No. Uh, no, because there are no numbers on this, but it, that's the point. Can you identify right where 952 is okay. his answer? Let's uh, give the witness an opportunity to answer the question. And can the, you identify where 952 is on this chart? Not specifically. He's picking at the chart because the chart is not numbered. He's, he's, I don't need and the chart's what's in evidence. The chart is all they admitted into evidence. As they, uh, defense, exhibit 142. So he's picking. And same thing. There's no numbers. There's no times on here either, right? It's all speculative because there's no, no numbers. Not, as, not on the x-axis at the bottom. Switch to the PowerPoint, please. And so that's why the prosecutor's picking. He's like, well, I could go look at my file. It's like, no, your file doesn't help. The jury has this in evidence. This is what you put in evidence. They can clean that on, up on, on redirect. Objects being thrown, ejected, traveling it. What was posited to you was 45 miles an hour. Do you remember that? Yes. Opinion? 
but the goal for the prosecutors to poke what holes are some in variables the assumptions. In, you're an engineer with math background. What are some variables you would need to know before determining the distance, trajectory, and speed of an object? Um, like, like, is the hypothetical if somebody threw a phone out of a window? My hypothetical is in order to determine the speed of any object, what are some variables that you would need to know in order to determine the distance it was thrown, the trajectory it was thrown, and the speed at which it was thrown? Like, what are lot. some information that you would need to know in order to posit an opinion about that? Well, there would be a lot of variables, but the main ones let's would go be, through I think I understand variables. your question, but let's, <laughs> let's say you find an object on the side of the road. It was four and questions you want to know one. how fast, let, let's just assume that somebody throws something out of a car that's driving down the road. And let's say this would be a typical problem people ask me or, or were presented with. It's like, well, can you calculate based on the physical evidence on the side of the road, how fast was the car traveling when the phone was thrown out? I mean, let's just look at it that way. So how often does that like come you would up? Need to know, like, let's say that it was on the shoulder of a road and there was like a, an impact mark on the shoulder of the road. And then 57 feet later is the phone, right? So you could make a, you could make a pretty good determination. The phone tumbled 57 feet. Well, a tumbling object decelerates at about a half a G, and that's 11 miles per hour per second. So over 57 feet, you could back calculate it. You're He's trying come to outmath them. Probably like 30 miles per hour, right? The variables would be the condition of the shoulder, um, you know, obviously the speed that it's thrown out. How it's right. thrown. Energy, right? Right, because, because, for instance, if you're driving down the road, you could throw it forward, you could throw it backwards. So you may want to add the speed or subtract the speed from the, from the velocity of the vehicle. And I'm going to let you keep going, but okay. just I'm trying to answer the question, interrupt it again. Your Honor. Uh, were you through answering that question? I think so. I think uh, that's probably uh, right. Next question. All right. About the he said I'm going to let you strength, finish. I think you said strength <laughs> of the throw. Is that, is that what you were talking about when we last cut? That's what he said. Well. It's variables. Right, because. If you just drop the phone from the car, it has zero initial velocity relative to the car, but the car has relative velocity to the road. So, for instance, it's going to have a different trajectory if you throw it straight down out your window. Oh, he did just Kanye the witness. Throw it up in the yep. air, throw it sideways. Those are all what's, co what's called I'm initial you finish, conditions. But. And so, but, you know, if you had information, you, let's say you had a witness in the passenger seat that said, well, he tossed it straight out of the window, then you could calculate it that way. But you would need more information. So, it's, you know, to, to know specifically this type of problem, you would need to know he's a lot of different He's just mathing to it. Get a, to, to get like a, if you said, how fast is this car going based on how far that phone tumbled down the street? Yeah, you would need to know some more information. So you'd need to know the energy thrown, the energy with, at which the object was thrown, correct? Yes, or the speed. Would you need to know the mass of the object that was thrown? No. That wouldn't matter? No. Okay. Would you need to know the wind resistance, if any? Yes. Would you need to know the, the mass? wind speed, if any? Somebody explain to me why the mass doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It, it depends I don't on understand. the problem, but that, that, might, that might be a factor. And absent any of those variables, really can't tell anything about an object that was thrown. Is that fair to say? Well, it depends on the question that's asked. Y'all are if, smarter than me. Why doesn't mass question, matter? It seems like mass would matter. Going, then, yes, you would need all those variables unless you wanted a wide range of answers. But if you ask me, if you toss a phone at near highway speed or close to highway speed, will it tumble? It's a completely different question. There's no variables there. That's just fact. You've lost the chat with mass doesn't matter, this sir. The chat, the chat has turned <laughs> on this on this item on this item the yeeting the phone with you saying mass doesn't matter seems i'm sorry i don't know physics well i shoot bows and arrows that is my experiments with physics is this the side of the but is this the side of the road that you if you're throwing a feather or if you're throwing a phone it would be different if you try to throw a ball of paper it's going to be different than throwing a phone does that look like it also? States, uh, sorry, I'm showing you states 231. 
Yes, I know there's woods on the east side and there's an open field on the west side. I think that this witness was asked this at the spur of the moment and was pontificating perhaps outside of where he should have been pontificating. I think I just sloshed water all over my desk. That's delightful of me. How did I do that? Oh no! My pink sticky note has leaked pink all over my desk. Oh, that's not gonna come off. Perfect. Big pink stain. I'll just do the Oh goody. That's delightful. All right, well, that is immortalized forever. Whose phone is, is that buzzing? Like a shot from the side of the road that you visited at, on Mazel. Yes. Okay. And what are we seeing here uh, in the background? What are we? What are we seeing? Oh, nail polish remover. Good call. Well, in the background, there's the field that's over on the uh, west side of the. All right, in front of the field. What is that? That's the roadway. Okay, and in front of that road, right in front of the road on the picture, the green stuff. Grass shoulder. All right, and then There's near the at the bottom of the screen, what are we seeing? It's like vegetation, leaves, sticks. Phones down here. You'd agree that brush, uh, sorry, leaves and grass is fairly soft. Would you agree with that? Yes. Showing you what's been it's entered as 232. Different angles that will get the same road to you. So the prosecution's yes, job is to, uh, well, any attorney's job is to north. poke holes in the other side's experts. How effective do you and think again, the hole poking has been? grass right on the side of the road yes that's on the west shoulder oh i do have magic racer thanks chat <clears throat> oh yeah these are back these are country roads <clears throat> when you do sound studies is it have you have you done work is it primarily for like osha related things or i know you mentioned some companies is that what the sound studies have primarily been for uh, it's it's typically that the work that i do now because the I, sound studies uh yes the acoustics okay. measurements that i do typically would be related to train whistles train horns emergency vehicles ah um back heard up those alarms today. where say somebody gets backed over with a truck uh audibility of backup alarms I've had audibility of warning alarms inside of a factory. Like, you know, could a worker hear the alarm and then get out of an area that was dangerous? So it's usually emergency signals um, is typical. I have worked on a criminal case where it wasn't a gunshot, it was a woman screaming. And could, could a particular, <gasps> they call them ear witnesses. And was there a sliding door? Could a particular ear witness hear a woman screaming at a, at a distance? And so. <clears throat> and it would would that be for workplace considerations? There was some accident at work, and it re maybe relates to OSHA. No, this was a murder case. Oh, so okay. the, yeah. the other things you mentioned pri previously. Sorry. Uh, no, the other ones, I mean, typically are going to be civil litigation, okay. where you know you you might have a dump truck manufacturer getting sued for not having an audible alarm that's you know loud enough, or or just plain or, or sometimes what happens in a, in a car accident i mean a car accident but like a back over accident they're saying that the person that got run over yes. should have heard the Chat. truck coming and got out just of the like way, ace ventura right? so people argue back and forth about who could hear and not hear like a backup alarm all right i'm going to direct your attention now to the uh, sound study that you conducted um, and it was in your, your PowerPoint. Why is the audio crackling? Um. For the uh, call me Cordelia, no, Alec did not For use this witness. Exhibit. This witness had opposed Alec, I guess digitally but he was hired on the civil boat case before he started working on this case. But it's the prosecution asked that right at the beginning of the cross examination. This girl said, thank you for explaining trial lingo. That is my right, goal. If, I could, if you could, please. I am your guide. Page 75 or exhibit 76. Huh? Okay, there you go. All right, and, and 
Remind me again, and I know it's visual over there, but how, what's the distance between the dog kennels and the house right there? Uh, straight line distance is 142 feet. Uh, 1,140. Oh, what did I say? I think you said 140. Oh, yeah, 1, no, it's, it's like 1,150 feet. Let's just call it 1,150. <laughs> 1,150. All right. Um, and that's in as the, the crow year. flies, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, you know, it might All have right, been in the criminal vote case. Over it might have been in the civil because Jim Griffin hired him, and that could have been on either aspect of the boat case. Exhibits. If you just fast forward for me, sorry. It seems I'm that they have the extended what this expert normally does, and whenever you're extending Exhibit an expert one, just, if you keep into going, things they don't the normally do, it out. can go very All right, this ammunition. What kind of ammunition is that? 300 blackout, 147 grain. This isn't Dr. Jacket. Spiegel bad, though. Okay. Do you know who the manufacturer of that is? It looks like Cellier and Below. Okay. All right. S &B, and that's the ammunition you that. used on the 300 blackout test? Yes. Okay. All right. If you would fast forward a couple. And this is, uh, is this your rifle? No. Okay. Uh, is this a person's rifle that was working for you? No, uh, this was a law, uh, the, the lawyer, Jim Griffin, provided the two weapons. Okay. Wait, is that the uh, rifle that's in court? Did you yourself test actually fire these weapons? Uh, no, an engineer in my office, his name's Michael Whitley. So since I was running the acoustic equipment up in the house, then Michael Whitley was the one that actually pulled the trigger. And <clears throat> are you familiar with this type of firearm? Yes. All right, what is that? Well, it's a 300 blackout, which is the name of the ammunition. And so basically what it is is an AR-15 style rifle they with a shorter barrel. They haven't addressed it yet. That'll and come And when they argument. shorten the barrel, they needed a specially designed um, ammo for it so it would be efficient. In other words, it's the type of weapon that might be used in close quarters, so it's shorter and you can move around and maneuver. But when you cut the barrel down to, say, eight or nine inches, you need to chamber a different round. That's basically what this is. And is it actually, are you aware it's actually considered a, a pistol for purposes of more, I, uh, government identifications? I don't what? know if this, this particular one is considered a pistol or not. Like I said, what? I'm not, I'm not a gun expert. But, That's fine. Yeah. He's trying to show um, that you're not a gem expert, or not a gun expert, but challenge, challenge, um, what? All right, this uh, categorized one's a pistol. All right, this picture, what are we looking at? That's the ammunition. That's the buckshot that we used. It is a pistol. All right, and is, okay. there a, is there a reason you chose this particular brand? Not a rifle. Uh, the Winchester was similar to the um, brand of ammunition used. Didn't know. What kind of ammunition is this type? It's a 12 gauge buckshot. It's like two and three quarter inch shells. I, I want to say that the buckshot in the murder was maybe a three inch shell, but okay. this is. Um, See, the chat has a, lots a of knowledge. Load. Thanks, chat. So similar, but not the same. That's correct. And not the same manufacturer. I think it was federal. I'd, was, ha I'd have to go. There was and federal and but, Winchester. But I, th I think there was federal and maybe Winchester. Okay. The reason is, is just because I know that the plastic shot cups were found at the crime scene, and I think that's Winchester. But I, I would have to go look. Okay. So, we, but you, you concede you didn't use the same gauge for buckshot as was used in the murder of Paul Murdoch. Uh, I know it, it. It's probably slightly different. Okay. All right, if you would please continue huh. exhibit seven. Okay. I appreciate again, that this witness doesn't here? back away from no, it uh, wasn't exactly. That would be the it might not have changed the conclusion. Shot with the smaller pellets that but we But he's used. not defensive about it, and I think that shows and an again, expert this that's is, confident uh, not in their the same conclusion. Word that was used in the murder of Paul Murdoch. I don't think it's the exact same, it's just representative. All right. So. It comes across much more confident right. than constantly please, dodging uh, the questions. 24, I think it's like two or three slides. And I do like the way there he's answering right. the questions. All right, and again, this is the interior of the house. I don't agree that, with that everything right? he said, yes. but I like the way he's answering. And I believe you already testified to it, but what was the ambient um, decibel reading inside that house? 35 decibels. Pretty much steady state. And is that, um, well, I guess we, we heard an audio clip right yes that we, that we played for the jury does the ability to hear something is it affected by the ambient noise yes in, in that's a room? What, yes do you have a did you do a test on what the ambient noise is in this courtroom no i can do it right now if you want me to 
Oh. Did you do it before? Does the ambient noise have an effect on how we hear something? Good yes, question. Yes, that's what I explained. So in order for you to... That's a good question. I see exactly where he's going with it's that. It's got to be 10 decibels so, above background. And we've if heard... If it's 10 decibels below background... Could we background, play this loud enough in court to hear, to hear it? And when you're in between, it depends on if you're listening for it. That's a like, very good if question. If you're really listening for something, like if you were at a train crossing... And you're listening for the train horn. The train is not it close to my right house, and I can hear it at night. Like you can't hear it during the day. Bit. The train horn can be right at the background level, but since you're listening for it, you might be able to hear it. If you're not paying attention, then, and then you might not. But if it's 10 decibels above your background, you will hear it. 10 decibels below, you're not going to hear it. Because again, that's twice You're as walking loud. into a long that's explanation of why the jury might not and hear that well because you didn't test and it. I know you gave an example of the concert. How did you decide, or how did anyone decide what volume to play that sound clip? Does, would volume affect your ability to hear something? Um, it does, but it really wouldn't matter because, again, the shot from the kennels was only 1 to 3 dB Doesn't above matter. background. So it was about you know, 36, 37, 38 decibels. I thought was like, yeah, it doesn't and matter. And even if you rustle a piece of paper, that could be in the 50s. And so it, it, there's... There's just, it doesn't really, in this case. It doesn't matter, he says. The volume of the TV, it really didn't matter just because the sound of the gun inside that house is so faint, it wouldn't make a difference. All right, and I know this is beyond, this may be outside your expertise, but just asking you common sense, um, are you aware that tr trees generally grow? Yes. Okay. So I, remind me again, what day did you go out and perform these Good uh, sound tests? Uh, I, the sound tests were January 5 of this year, so 23. Oh. And I know we have some pictures, um, if you wouldn't mind backing it up to exhibit Also 14. a good question, because we've heard from multiple law enforcement Close witnesses saying when they went out, fine. the okay, trees right grew fine. so much. Um, would this uh, tree they line test. on the back of picture exhibit 10 be consistent with what you saw in January? Yes, uh, that, the that is January. The trees back here. Okay. And the, uh, are you aware of what the date of the murder was? Uh, well, it's, that's uh, June the 7th of uh, 21, so basically th this picture's taken, let's say, what, 18 months later, 19 months later? And uh, I think you did testify that sounds, because speed travels in a straight line, sound would be affected by the tree line, is that correct? It will be on the other side of the tree line. It's also going straight up, too. It's like I said before, it's like a big half bubble, bubble getting bigger. Um, the um, uh, the trees probably obviously did grow in the year and a half when it happened. And I did make correction for the trees, but it was only, I think it was 1.7 dB, uh, if I recall. But um, So the trees made a difference, but not that big of a difference. Well, without being there in whatever the tree height were, would that have an effect on the sound level? I mean, I think you said you accommodated 1.7 dB, but will you agree that... A tr the height of a tree or a forest would have an effect on the sound. Oh, it, it'll have an effect, but in this case, it you know it's. He thinks the effect is two, no. Let's let's just call it two decibels, and what I'm talking about is, you know, background inside the house. If you have the TV on, is like 70 decibels, right? So we're look at, we're comparing 35 or 40 decibels. Whether we add or subtract two, it makes no difference because you got 70 versus 30 or 40. And remember, just 10 decibels is twice as loud. So 70 decibels is many, many times louder. So I, w I went through the process of making sure that the numbers were correct. But yeah, his answer is it doesn't minor matter. variables such as wind, humidity, wind speed, um, the trees, all of those, even if you if fact factored all of those in, it really doesn't make a difference just because the gunshot inside the house was so faint that you're just not going to hear it. All right, if you would, sir, if you wouldn't mind turning to exhibit 25, please. Uh, it would be for, toward the end, forward. I'm interested to see what the exhibit is, but he's like, it doesn't. The chart, yeah, the next one. He thinks next it doesn't make a difference. And again, okay. the jury, if the jury sees the difference in the trees, that might viscerally make a, ma uh, make a difference to them because they get to decide how much weight to give any given What's testimony? What's the decibels of a vacuum cleaner at three meters and a, and a gas lawnmower at 30 meters? What's the decibel rating on that? 70. 
Be the 70? missing gun yes. was a was a laser was sight. 70? 68. Leanne. So the Very same as the vacuum cleaner run observation. and the gas lawnmower. Well, the lawnmower is what, at 30 meters, you know, which is, that's, okay. you know, just, just 100 checking. feet. It must well, be a pretty quiet vacuum cleaner because of my, in my experience, a vacuum cleaner is a lot louder than 70 decibels. What was the uh, decibel reading that you measured for the shotgun blast again? Around 154, I believe. It's on the next slide. And what was the reading for the rifle? 165. I think the you text on this is a little blurry for me, so it's probably blurry for you. That's just you the know, way it's coming out from extrapolating court. Extrapolating the sound over distance. Yes. Okay. And I think you said, but the sound um, dissipates six decibels for every twice the distance. Is that fair to say? Yes. Is that accurate? <laughs> Matters yes. has no chill in his yes. face. So if you wouldn't mind, could you extrapolate for me? So at 165, which is what the rifle tested at, could you reverse extrapolate that to 1,024 feet? Could you do the math? Yes, I, I, I have that. <clears throat> He's making people math on the stand again. I'm just going to take a minute to say, well, hey. It's actually a slide, um, but I, we, I've got the chart. We have our second. alert system for email alerts ready if you want to sign up for them. Those so are, what I did was. Um, I'm going to list them in the description. I'll pin a, pin a comment in a minute. When you add in the attenuation, uh, what distance do you want to know? 1,024 feet. So basically just like outside the house? Yeah. Yeah. Just the okay. The so, so because of the weather conditions, I adjusted the number up for, I'm assuming we, we want to talk about the night of the murders, right? I just want to know if you could reverse extra, if you could extrapolate, I don't want to know about weather conditions or anything yeah. right now. I just want to extrapolate 165 decibels beginning at, uh, you know, three feet or three beginning at three yep, feet. Now I'm and just like, I want to extrapolate huh? it to 1,024 feet, and those are even it's, numbers. It's 89.5 decibels. Okay. I don't know if the lawyer is going to out engineer that, the engineer yes, physicist. I don't, decibels. this let's, could go very just badly. Just right outside the house. This could go badly quickly. Wait, wait what are you saying? Right outside the house? Yes. In, inside the house, it was. It's in my other report. Inside the house, it was maybe 35 to 38 decibels inside the house. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. I, I, I don't want to know inside the house, outside the house. I just want to know in a, in a, in a lab setting, you have a 165 decibel blast. Right. Measured at three feet. So 165 <clears throat> decibels at three feet. If you extrapolated that out for distance, what would the decibel be? Just pure, just, just lab setting. Lab what would setting. The, what would the mathematical equation be? Well, it would, it would be a little bit different in a lab setting. This okay. is not a lab setting. But if you did, you go, I don't have that written out. You may have already done it. But if you take three feet. Would you disagree? Let me ask you this. Yeah. And I'm, it's not a trick question. Lab setting, we can put all the qualifications in. Oh. But would it be at 1,024 feet? Would you have any reason to doubt that it would be at 100, <clears throat> 105 decibels? Don't that try to out expert right. the I, I expert. We were doing much time. better with the reasonable the questions point. like, hey, trees and did this and that. Mind, this, at, trying to out expert the expert is, is just going to lose everybody, and y'all are seeing it. It's like, ugh. Let's see. Okay. Just what the chart says. What does it the chart says say? Ding, 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 what does the chart say? You have to make a point, counsel. Would you agree that a, a cat's meowing or a cat is fairly low on the decibel meter? Not yeah. my cat. Have you met my cat? My cat Certainly can be an asshole. Certainly if the cat was outside and you're inside. I can hear him. Hard to hear. Is that, would that be oh, fair to nope. say? Yeah, unless the window's open. I can hear George outside the sliding glass doors. We have a covered oh. catio. I'm gonna George loves catio. But when he's ready to come in, he makes a racket. Cats can be uh, loud as fuck. Mind <laughs> starting at page. All of you. All of you. Uh, Glenn Jacobson, seven. this is a commentary channel, so you're free to go. So just self yeet. Cause uh, we talk here. 
Yeah, you have to keep going. Self heat. The first part of this. There this attorney is trying All so right, um, hard. Referring to your exhibit 57 on to out -engineer. Your PowerPoint. Um, I know you testified too, but are you familiar with what this image shows? Yes. All right, and this is the uh, feed room hmm. um, with the uh, a view of the window. Is that correct? That's correct. And this is not a picture you took. Is that fair to say? No, this is the night um, crime scene pictures from June 7th. All right. <clears throat> do you do you just visually looking at it? Do you see holes in the window? Yes. Okay. Do you see a whole lot of other stuff in that picture on the shelves, in front of it, behind it, below it, above it? Yes. All right, if you wouldn't please uh, continue on to the next slides. Um, I'm going to go to your exhibit 45. It's going the other way um, towards the end of it. Right there, our 44 is fine. All right, so I think you testified that you kind of visually looked through the hole in the window and kind of aligned your eye with the tree outside. Is that, is that kind of how it went? No. You said you, correct me if I'm wrong, you can tell me in a second, but didn't you say you lowered your head to where you perceived a, sh a, sh a chest wound would be and looked out the window and tried to align it with that defect? Yes. Okay. So the only thing I missed was lowering my, your head, right? Right, I, and I didn't down. do it at the window. I did it in the middle of the room. Okay. <clears throat> now, we've already established you have no training, experience, or expertise in shotguns. Is that correct? Well, maybe you need to explain a little bit more. Well, what, what do you have any formal training, formal expertise, formal, formal education in how shotguns work, how shotgun projectiles work, and what they do after leaving the end of that barrel. Do you have any formal training, expertise, certifications, anything? Well, not formal training, but Thank I've you. done a lot of study and I've also tested shotguns and I've fired many shotguns before. I understand what happened to the pellets and this particular pellet is one of the pellets that would have passed through Paul. All right. <clears throat> What's the spread of a shotgun pellet exiting a shotgun Barrel. What's the what's the spread? Every one inch. Well, it's going to vary based on the choke and He's the ammunition. He's asking but for this the one, expert it's clear questions that, that aren't the experts. The spread area of expertise is about the size of to a prove window a point. Because just the like the defense muzzle did. Muzzle of the shotgun was maybe let's call it three feet inside the door. It's a ten foot long room. So at seven feet, the spread of these pellets after passing through a person, the spread of them is probably that window may be 26 inches wide so that's going to be the spread um, obviously there can be some deflection of the pellets as they pass through the body of the victim would that be a variable sure okay so do you know the spread of a shotgun every yard how, how much it spreads the cone do you know how much it spreads per yard what kind of choke any choke, any gauge. I don't Do know. Do you the know? I don't know the number off okay. the top of my head. You don't know. Do you even know it? Not even off the top of your head without looking it up. I would have to look it up. Okay. And do you know the range of fire for 10 feet, what that spread is in centimeters? Do you know? Or inches? Well, either. I don't have this okay. committed to memory. I would look it up. Is that, a, is that even something you've ever known, or is that something you would have to look up? Like I said before, I have having to look it up is not like before. the ultimate. I'm not asking you to be a Oh, counsel! But got again, a lot of answer. It's not something that I have committed to memory. Got a lot of answer. Again, this, you know, if if you, you wanted to, to know something answer. like that, if that was helpful in this particular case, then what you would do is then you would go to the literature and, and find those answers. But I don't, I don't have that memorized. Well, aren't you rendering an opinion by drawing a line? By saying somehow that that exited, he's trying the to make a point. I mean, but at some the point, with them getting them snippy the doesn't help. See this line. Are you not giving an opinion of its exit? I'm giving an opinion that a pellet from that shotgun followed that line and struck the tree. And yet you don't even know the cone and the rate of expansion of a shotgun. How okay. can you right. give that opinion? Well, you That's don't fair. need to know that. Okay. So because what you have here, right. you got a hole in the window, and we have a slide for it. There's a hole in the window. 
there is an impact mark on the tree. That pellet traveled a straight distance between those two points, and two points forms a line. You don't need to know the spread. I mean, that's, that's actually what happened was a pellet came out of that gun, it passed through the victim, it went through a hole in the window, and it hit the tree. How do you know then? Are you, how do you know it passed through the victim? How do you know that? Well, it has nine pellets in the shotgun. Mm -hmm. Paul had one pellet in his shoulder. Sled recovered seven. I recovered nine. So I recovered the last pellet. All right, so okay. how do you know that? How do you know that? What are you basing that on? What you just testified to, what are you basing that on? That's fair. Um, well, when I looked at the sled records, they found seven pellets um, or that went through his body. They didn't find all the pellets, but he had um, eight entrance wounds. He had seven exit wounds. They found one pellet in his body, so that's eight. But we know the manufacturer puts nine. When I went to the crime scene, but there could—that's not precise either. They October asked 19, the expert. October 19, 2021, the ninth buckshot pellet was in the window frame. <clears throat> How do you know that was the ninth buckshot pellet that went to? Did you analyze it? He's well, assuming. Um, he's trying to get him to say he's assuming. I didn't analyze it, okay. but, but are you assuming? Okay, Your Honor, <laughs> not allowing him to answer the question. He said I didn't analyze it, but and then he interrupted him. I didn't hear the but. But go ahead. Oh, so the window got shot, right? Most of the pellets went through the window. Um, some of the pellets went through the little white parts of the window. Um, there was one pellet that sled didn't recover, and the reason is it was under kind of the lip. You know how where you pick up on a window, there's a thing where you put your fingers. It was under that, but still there. So you have a pattern of buckshot pellets like this big. And so you got nine holes, basically, or eight, because there was one pellet left in the victim, right? So, How nine, many? My, so nine minus the one, so you have eight. There are eight holes in that window. In my world, that's a very high probability that those are the pellets that came from the buckshot that injured uh, Paul Murdoch. Two sides forward. Two sides forward. What's this big thing here at the bottom? That big opening. A defect? Exhibit 47. Are you talking about the missing glass? Yeah, what is that? It's missing glass. All right. Wouldn't that change How many the pellets went through there? I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but I accounted for every pellet, except for the one that was missed by the crime scene investigators, which uh, is under the... What's missed oh, by the okay, crime scene investigators? How many grains was the pellet you located on the windowsill? I appreciate that. I never waited. Okay. Do you see Again, the shade he threw back at sled? Do you, do you really know it came from there, or are you assuming it came from there? Well, the what window you know? got shot with buckshot, and there's one missing pellet. Again, in my world, there's a very high confidence level that that missing pellet is there. Um, is that the same confidence level that you're using for all these other opinions? That? Yeah. That all, you found a pellet? All my opinions are at a very high confidence level. Okay. Yes. Well, we're going to go through them. I'm sure we are. <laughs> Y'all, we're fixing the link for the law. The here, to them. We got I object to that question. We're going to get to them. That's what he said. All right. We, of course, sustains objection to the comment. Uh, Stop right. making comments. Except, unless you're me. The rope here, this orange rope, is that the one that continues back to the tree? Yes. All right. Do you have any formal training in what an I, what a projectile does if it strikes anything, be it human flesh or glass, or any of the other items that would have been located. Do you have any training in that? Again, not formal training, but it obeys the laws of physics, and I've tested it myself. And I know physics. And That's I've what studied he's saying. impacts. That's the, a big part of what I do. So. Have you done a test where you shot shotguns through glass, through wood, and through a human body, and then measured where they ended up? Have you done those tests? No, you don't need to test it because you can just look and see what happened to it. So is the answer no? I didn't do any testing with the shotgun here, but why would you need to test because the, I think we got the same slide up there. Would you agree with me? Well, I can't ask you a question, but <laughs> that pellet, that pellet right there went that through that funny. window. 
and it lodged in a tree or damaged the tree. Something damaged the tree. I don't need to test that because that's just what happened. All I mean, right, it's, is, it, it's, is it's, it your opinion that it can only be that pellet? There's no other possibility. No other possibility. Is that your opinion? Well, I'm, I'm not saying that there might be some highly lower probability, but if you stand in that room and we have holes and just like you've shown, they're scattered all over that window and you look in the direction of the damage to the tree where Paul was injured, that is the only one. And it, it just, it, it's just, uh, I don't think it really matters one way or the other. All I can say is, is that I think the shot went through Paul in the manner that I presented it today. Okay. It really I, doesn't matter to me all that much which pellet went through which hole. And I just want to be clear, you have no formal training in this, no path pathological He's training. He's not bothered what went through Correct. what hole. Uh, I am not a pathologist. Okay. But you opine that you believe it went through Paul and then exited the window and struck that tree, but you have no formal training in any of that, correct? No pathology, no firearms, no shotgun specific training other than anecdotal shooting a shotgun? None of that, no formal trainings, is I would that correct? I would disagree with, disagree with all of that because again, you know, it doesn't take a pathologist there's a small entry wound into Paul's chest. So all nine pellets enter. One remains in his body. Eight leave his body. You are sitting right? here opining so, about pathology. Is that correct? I no, I don't think that's, that's a fair characterization. That's, that's not a fair characterization. Nine minus one is eight. At all. There is some, that's based on underlying assumptions. And um, he can exhibit, point out the underlying I don't know assumptions. What is exhibit 81 or 80? So he could point out the underlying assumptions but this is what he's doing so that's where we're at sorry y'all we had some link link a link a dink issues when we when we do something new we always All try right, to go break we'll it, it. We'll go, we'll start there. didn't expect go it to break so fast couple. yeah right here did you take this picture no how many inches does that look like he is tall well, you can't tell how tall he is because <laughs> then why? of this picture's taken. Well, Add the picture. Like? This shows his shoulder 64 inches. What about his head? You can't tell. You can't see a number at the top of there? Uh, no, because you'd have to be above the top of his head or right in line with the top of his head. The only thing you can glean from this picture is that his shoulder is 64 inches above the floor. Okay. Is he wearing shoes? All right, I'm going to ask you um, Just to ask about it. use of Faro. Are you, have you, are you the one who actually operates the Faro equipment? Uh, I do, but in this particular time, somebody else did. And did your equipment, was it, has it been calibrated recently? Yes, we calibrate every year. Every what, sorry? Every year. Did you actually operate it this night? Rob, I think that's no, fair I for the believe, bullet hole um, in the tree, but Michael for the Whitley. sound. Yeah, for the sound, the tops of the, in my office, the um, pine trees are he higher. Was the one that day that was doing the scan. So they could impede the sound. I think and it's fair for the bullet. You described as the uh, time, as a sort of a time of flight laser. Is that is that your testimony? Yes, it uses a laser and it, it, it creates points. It creates a point cloud. Is it fair to say that it's not actually a time of flight laser? It's a phase based laser. Would that be more accurate? I have no idea. Oh my so God, counsel. Were they sharks with lasers? I just right, beginning at, if, just hit the, on just the most valuable off. points and move on. I, are we arguing over Fero? You used it, SLED used no, it, the, uh, he used it. Stop it. Yeah, like slide one. <sighs> just does it matter? I think some of the points in cross were good, but did then he kept the, banging um, on. He's going to lose the whole point that he the made. Addition, I know that we're going to get to it, but there's some uh, individuals you put in the uh, in the Faro report. Did you were you the one who actually added that 3D render, or was someone else someone else do it? Uh, no, um, I had several engineers help me on this project. So uh, Aaron Kiefer is an engineer in my office. He he did a lot of the work on uh, the point cloud and. Uh, Matt Kiefer, actually his brother, did work with um, 
taking those scanned people and turning them into shooters. So sometimes I would say five or six engineers in my office have worked on this. Sometimes a good cross-examination knows when All to right, stop. The, what we're seeing here is a quail, the, what, what's called the quail pen. Is that, is that your understanding? The getting yes. snarky. And again, this we'll is not your jury. picture. This was the one taken from There's the, no the need to get snarky with this witness. Uh, this is a this witness didn't get snarky with him first. He got snarky yeah. first. And next exhibit, please, exhibit 63. So at some point, Would this be a close up of that. You need yes. to go to the things and that matter most and keep moving. The phone was here, good. That's a, is that, that's a paper product. I and think you already testified to it, but that's a paper type product. Yes. Okay. You can actually see it's like bending warped because it got wet. Yes. So it's, it's pretty thin. Yes. All right, and the next slide, please. Now this is uh, what's purported to be a projectile hole. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, yes, um, that is a projectile hole. And you testified, I think you testified about the, uh, what, what, you tell me, what did, what did you call this um, indentation on the right side of that hole? I called it a white mark. The bullet's coming in at 41 degrees, kind of from the right. So that represents where the tip of the bullet first touched the cardboard or the fiber board. Do you, and I think you already testified this, but you have no formal training or experience or certifications in crime scene investigations. Is that correct? I've answered that. It, it all comes from experience and my education. Okay. And are you f aware that there's a, uh, a margin of error for the angles that may be measured in a projectile, especially if it's a soft paper product? Uh, sure. Um, there can be, and also depends on how you measurement, measure it. So I, I took what uh, Special Agent Worley measured. Caroline like I said before, Sansbury from like Real Housewives of Dubai a based on it didn't match gave up me the this sweatshirt. Evidence. That's why I put my teen stole it. I picked a range of one and a half to three degrees. <laughs> <clears throat> Keep going. Next one, please. And right here we're seeing a, a metal dowel. Is that your understanding? What that is? I don't know if it's metal or fiberglass, but it's it's some type of material like that that's going to be straight. And on top of it is, a, is an angle measure. Is that yes. fair to say? And they're sitting on top of that hole, which is essentially a paper product. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And no projectile was actually recovered from this um, uh, project uh, from this uh, direction of, of shot. Is that correct? Is that That's your understanding? My, that is my understanding. All right, and if you wouldn't mind skipping forward to uh, exhibit, exhibit 35. How tall is that doghouse? It is the look point. he gets when he wears this sweatshirt in public <clears throat> cracks me up. I watched her on Ladies of London first, too. We had a great chat at BravoCon. She's just a fun, fun human. We had a really nice time. And the horrible human sweatshirt is great. paper flipping it's probably going to be about four feet tall what are you relying on when you say that uh, this is a uh, special agent Worley's my notes. armpits does your ferro scan make measurements of items? I think you testified to that. Now it does. Um, you know, if you wanted me to give you my measurement of it, I would, you know, have to open it up. It might take a while if you want to take a break. Okay. So you don't know <laughs> off the top of your head? I do not have the doghouse height memorized. All right, moving forward. It's in. And I think we saw here, this is the project, uh, this is the um, entry spot of the projectile into the doghouse. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. Moving forward. Moving forward. And this Moving again forward. would be the same thing, a rod, but this time in again, a more all these measurements firm, uh, sled has. The wood in this in this case is much more firm than so some of this uh, the some of this is exactly product, the same right? as the defense asking yes, the person whose job it's not to do <clears> the thing. It's the same exact strategy. The, uh, a bullet which appeared to have gone through the doghouse and was recovered from inside. Is that your understanding, having reviewed the crime scene? Uh, yes. Crime scene reports. Yes. 
And do you have any formal studying, study experience, training, or otherwise on what a bullet might do when it strikes wood or whatever the interior He's getting of the dog pen held, including You don't know if it changes trajectory. Well, again, it, Correct. it's the same line of questioning. It would be based on my experience. I, I, I can't say that I've ever done any specific testing for wood. I've certainly reviewed papers and literature concerning I want to make such, a joke about testing for wood. Typically, I don't stop. Just, um, go into that area of ballistics. I look more at impact marks and then just the flight path of the bullet because that's just physics. And then I'm going to Every time he says that's just physics. To some of your Faro, ex um, uh, Faro images, um, uh, if you wouldn't mind, keep, scoot forward a little bit more. You guys can be annoyed with the cross. Don't need to apologize. There was there was a point where this cross was really helpful. Oh, please. This cross was really helpful, right, and here, then we wandered these, well um, beyond that point. Don't be like, sorry, I'm annoyed. Just feel your feelings. It's the, fine. Uh, <clears throat> We're just here to watch the, body the trial. That's laying there, covered in a sheet, that was added after the fact. That's not part of the Faro scan, is that right? That is correct. He that's, made a good point at the beginning. As well as and the now we're here. Workers. All right, and um, I know the the markers we see on this picture is just representative. There's the placards, and this is this the one where you tried to merge kind of uh, what the placards were with in the, the Faro scan. Yes. This, and the, uh, this is an excellent the little point. circular I trusted X's you guys measured the, properly. Uh, computer assisted drawing that you made based on the measurements uh, performed by. Uh, I relied on Molly. sled. That's correct. All right. I relied on the sled measurements. Okay. I, right, I assumed nice people did their jobs. The, we start with these uh, green Might lines. be too snarky, but it would be funny. I wouldn't be mad about it. There you go. All right. We're looking at exhibit, it doesn't even say, but exhibit with the two lines um, spread out. Is that the uh, representative of the two different angles that were noted on this on the quail pen? Yes. So, what, do you know which one's which? Which one's the one degree and which one's the three? Well, the three degree is going to slope towards the ground quicker, so that would be the bottom line, and then the one and a half slopes less. You know, it's, it's more gradual slope, so it would be the top line. Okay. Going forward one. And here's where you inserted a 3D um, person as, as a. A 5-2 person, is that who Some you inserted there? Some of these are based yes. on assumptions, which I think okay. is fair. And <clears throat> you chose to insert a 5-2 individual shooting from the hip in that manner that aligns with that green line. Is that what you did? Yes. Okay. Good way to ask. You chose. And nowhere on here is any other individual on that green line. Is that correct? You didn't put any other images here. You only chose to put a 5-2 individual slinging a, a gun on his hip. Well, that's what matches. If the person was any taller, then they would have to be towards the quail pen. If they were any shorter, then they would be behind the shooter. Or the shooter would be in a different posture. And do you have any idea if um, a bullet can ricochet? Uh, of course. They can, right? Yes. If they hit something. Yes. And he you don't know that. because we didn't recover that bullet, but you don't know if that was a ricochet, is it? Is it possible? Um, it could be possible, but okay. um, I don't see any evidence from the crime scene investigation that it, it was a ricochet. Okay, but it's possible, right? I think it's very yeah. unlikely because of the hole in the That's side of the quail fair. pen. Usually when a bullet ricochets, it'll, it'll, it'll get upset, so the hole in the quail pen should have been bigger. So the shooter, according to your lines here, the shooter could have been anywhere on that line. Is that correct? Anywhere yes. on that line? Yes. All right, if we keep going. This is just another one showing them same posture, just on different points See, of those lines. See, it went from interesting to feeling accurate? Yes. overdone. So as long as that's gone, and, and we'll not worry about the 5 to 11-year-old, but if, if, if anyone's on that line, it could have been accurate, right? If any, if that gun is anywhere on that line, according to you, it could have been accurate. Is that right? It could yes, have been and, that shot. Yes. And anywhere. That's what I explained is, is that the line right, by definition establishes where the weapon is. Then the next step would be to figure out where the person is or where the so shooter is. I just want to be clear. Anywhere Please. from this point we all the way, I guess, until it hits the, it would eventually hit the ground, right? Correct. Anywhere until it hits the ground, somewhere back behind where the bodies are located. It's your testimony that it is that is consistent with what you're seeing. Yes. As long as that gun is on that line. Yes. Right. 
So we can just remove the 11 year olds from the equation. As long as that gun's on that line, it fits with what you're, you're saying your mathematics is saying, is lines up. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And you didn't do any, you didn't provide any renders of any other adult sized human beings, perhaps kneeling, did you? <clears throat> um, repeat that. You didn't do any other renders along these lines of an adult sized human being kneeling on the ground. An adult sized human uh, being. I know. What I did do if is he, consider that. Because, these shorter jurors are going to be deeply I mean, offended. Obviously, from your question, you kind of can see that yes, in your chaps. mind. Okay, I'm well, just asking for a yes or no. Well, I did. I did. <laughs> Let me explain. He's attempting to answer the question. <clears throat> again. Okay, so what I did. Oh, Dick. He's like, again. Question. I know. He's like, so if I you're five foot you two, you're fun sized, right? It's not right. What I did was at one foot increments from the quail pen all the way out to 60 feet. And at 60 feet, you're getting pretty close to where that line goes underground. It actually goes underground about 73 feet, okay? So what I did was I looked at the height of the shooter's hand, just like we did this morning in front of the jury. And the other thing I looked at was where the center of the shell casings, the empty casings were, okay? And I looked in a 12 foot circle around the shell casings, like the center of those, those shell casings, figuring that everything that I've seen typically these rifles are going to be 8, 10, 12 feet, big variable, and it's just, you know, just a rough number. This is what I did, though. Um, first thing you look at is, is that Alex is 76 inches tall. I measured to his knee is 25 inches. So that means that if he went down on one knee, his shoulder is still 51 inches above the ground. And if he shouldered the rifle in a kneeling position, he still can't make the quail shot because his, the muzzle would be above where the hole is. So that's number one. So the more you back him up, then it just gets more and more improbable. So then what I said was this. So I looked at this and the height of the, the shooter's hand, whoever the shooter was in whatever posture they were in, um, was between Assuming a 12 foot, big 12 foot radius circle, so what, however big that is, 24 feet circle around the shell casings. The shooter's hand is 16.2 to 27.6 inches above the ground. So that's basically two feet above the ground. So that's why it only fits. You said 11 year old kid, but it only He's fits. He's like the with hand the short has to person. be. Or. Or with some bizarre shooting posture that doesn't match an aiming position or a normal shooting position or just an abnormal shooting position. And we're not necessarily That's saying it's an aiming from, position. That's a I'd lot like of rounds. To, I mean, with the blackout here, if you want to, try to put this gun 27.6 to 16.2 inches and tell me that that's not somebody that's very low All to the right, ground. Hey, answer me this. How, how far off the ground is that Too gun close. right there? in the 12 year old's hand. Which yeah. one? He's never said 12 year old. Objection is overruled. Uh, which, which shooter? Your Honor, uh, Doesn't matter. There's, there's Doesn't no matter. record, nothing in the record about a 12 year old shooting this gun. Objection is overruled. Uh, let, let's go with the, see the back guy. I call, right. I'll call him the, the far shooter. How, how high is that gun? <clears throat> so he is, he the is 33 feet from the quail is pen. at risk to making it too ridiculous and, and pissing off the jury. That, which we'll is see. The one and a half. But this is going to take forever. Yep, he's going to. The bottom of his hand is going to be like right there at that 28 inch mark. Where's the line located right there? The line where the barrel, according to you, is? <clears throat> at 33 feet, the muzzle. The muzzle. 33 feet. For the rear shooter, I think it's they're trying to get to it's possible. The thing for the uh, prosecution is that they need to get beyond it's possible. It's possible inches. does not does not a, a conviction make at all. Yep. Do you have a take measure? Oh, here they're just trying to undercut this. Yikes! This expert. 
But I appreciate that they're just going to be like, all right, let's just do all of the experiments. Are they not inches right there? Yeah. If we back it up 10 feet, back it up 10 feet, what's the, what's the distance? What's the green line at? 10 feet back, so 40 feet. Uh, it would be... Uh, I think the tape measure is a good, um, a good visual. That's three feet, three, three feet, five point five inches. Is that right? That is correct. My finger, that look about right? Yes. Right there? Yes. Oh, shit. Right there. Yes. Okay. That's a good, stop now. Stop now. Council, stop now. Stop now. So we got this. We got stop the renders that you now. went with these right? Yes. Okay. That was very impactful. Stop now. If you wouldn't fast forward a little bit. Oh, damn it. Great right example. Okay. Now stop. So now we got, what's the angle of this um, doghouse that you calculated? <laughs> That's uh, 14 degrees. All right, and the shooter, the, uh, the You little, get too far away from that example, they're going to. The youth well, there, the youth is how, uh, how far away from that? It was a good example. The youth. If he gets to the two youths, I'm going to fall out of my chair. This is a double homicide trial, but it's like the youth was how far? 8.4 feet. And how high off the ground is that green line where, he, where he's it, standing? That was a good visual. That little guy. That's too snarky. Did you hear him say that little guy? So the muzzle is 29 inches above the ground. Too much. 29 inches. Maybe 30. 30 inches. So right here? 30. Yes. He didn't lean into that example nearly enough. I, he saw so it. 30 inches when you're up close right next to that dog. He had house. a point. So what happens then when you back, I see the line, it's, it's going upwards. So what happens when you back up? I mean, soon it's gonna be over the little guy's head, right? Yes. <laughs> but what happens oh, if you're not such a little guy? If you back up, I don't know, let's back us up five feet, what happens? Let's see, so that would be about Uh, 47.4. 47.4. Let's see. Is that about right? Yes. I can bring it closer. Uh, yes. 40, um, you see it? Finger? Yes. Okay. 47.4. It's right there. Yes. I'm glad we could demonstrate those heights to the jury. Thank you. Do you have a question? Is there a question pending or are we just making comments? Fast forward a little bit more about. Because uh, you had a really good demonstration number, and that should have been slides. the end. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, right here is fine. That, that's good. That's good. Now, and I just want to be clear you talk about casings. It's cartridge casings, um, and, and you're aware that shotguns have shells and rifles have cartridges. Is that correct? Is that correct? Is that your understanding? I just, yeah. I well, call it a rifle cartridge, but a rifle cartridge would be the bullet and the casing and the charge, the charge or the gunpowder inside the, the casing. But I call them rifle casings. Okay. Well, I mean, before you just call the shell casings, I just want to be clear. All right. So... The, uh, and you talked about, I know you spent some time some talking point, about Some point you the, lose the a good point when you keep of, going. Of cartridge casings from a rifle or an AR style rifle. Um, but you have no training or experience in that other than uh, the, we don't the, studies, care anymore. The, the studies you've personally conducted. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. In literature, which again, for this rifle, it's supposed to be 3 o'clock to 4.30, which is 45 degrees behind, but it can be forward. And it, can be, it can be straight out to the side. And I'm just tapping into common sense here, but <clears throat> you weren't at the scene in the night of the murders. Is that right? I was not there. Okay. And so is it possible that cartridge casings were moved? Yes. Is it possible that cartridge casings were ejected in an Council? unorthodox manner? Council. Yes. Is it possible? Is your that argument sled fucked up the investigation were, scene by kicking um, around casings? Uh, ricocheted it, off of something. Hit something and ricocheted. Yes. What? So where they laid, 
and this is just, again, tap into the common sense, not, not your engineering <laughs> background. But where they laid may not necessarily be where they fell that night. Is that I fair was, to say? I was fixing yes. our lawn art alert website. You're looking for just the, the area, argue, for instance. He's arguing sled screwed up the crime scene, I think. position 60 feet away makes no sense. But anywhere in that It's possible that everything got moved on the crime scene. Yes, because there's, there's cases. You would agree sled could have done this better. And good here, Lord. What, what are we... Uh, what are we showing here? Tell, tell, remind me again what this, and I think there's one. Either they could have bounced. They could have rolled. An exhibit before. What are, what are we seeing here? There's a lot of things that could have happened. the intersection of the three lines. What are you saying? I'm saying that the two shots made in two different directions can be made from approximately the same spot. Does that assume, though, that someone's shooting from approximately the same spot? Does that assume that right there? This is assuming someone's in the general same area when they shoot. Well, I, I used a constant height shooter, put them on the trajectories, and they end up in the same spot. Is it possible that someone shoots from one position and then moves to another position before they shoot again? Is that possible? Sure. Okay. And along your lines, it's, still, it's, it's, it's very possible that someone could have shot over here, and again, they were maybe a bigger person than the 12-year-old, and someone could have then moved okay. before they shot again. Is that, is that a possibility? Is that possible? Of course. Well, I mean, that's what this slide depicts is the shooter moving. That it's possible. Right. Is it possible that they were back here and back here? I don't know if possible. If anything's possible, it doesn't get you beyond a reasonable doubt. Two feet you, you put on your drawing. No, they would, they, well, they would have to change their shooting posture. That's kind of the whole point is it's like, for instance, you know, if you want to, like your line of questioning, let's say that the shooter is laying down or on one knee, then stands up and shoots from the hip. I don't know if that's really consistent with a moving shooter, but it's my understanding from what people have determined and what I've heard in expert reports from the state is, is that they think the shooter was moving. So I, I was thinking that it, it, it doesn't have to be, but what's most likely is that somebody is walking around shooting a gun. Okay. Again, you weren't there. You have no firearms training, is that right? Or we know, counsel. Or crime scene training or certifications. Is that right? It's compound. I was not there. So this is your best guess. Is that just, is that what it is? No, that is not a guess. So it that, that be. is based, so, let me finish. It's science. That is based on all of the engineering That's principles, what he's saying. the physical evidence that was collected by both myself and Special Agent Worley. That is the physical evidence. Now, as you've done today, you can think about alternatives, and there very well can be alternatives. But you have to look at how likely the alternatives are. You have are. to prove those and alternatives at some that's point. That's what I'm doing here. There's always going to be variables. You can move things around, but I think as I've tried to get across today is that you draw a conclusion when you look at the evidence. So not a guess, a conclusion. Okay. And you're, and you're here to say, to testify to these jurors that your most likely answer is that it was a 12 year old, two 12 year olds. Counsel. Five two. Yes, your Honor, right there's been here. no testimony that two 12 year olds are involved in this anyway, misstating the facts. Sustain the objection. Assumes facts, not in evidence. You're saying though that two five two. Which Humans. We can all guess approximates what size individual or age of individuals, that's your, best, that's your best guess of what went on that night? It's not a guess. And again, yep, too far. it's not two individuals. It's, it could be one person moving slightly there. Could be one um, person. But that is not a guess. That is my opinion. And I've, I've tried to explain it to the court as best as I possibly can. I really want him to say, physics is complicated. Maybe you just don't understand, counsel. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for him to snark back. He's not. He's been very professional with it. But it's just... You have pushed too far. Why do we need to consult with everyone at council table? You should have stopped when you got down on one knee and held the tape measure and went, so that? That is when we should have stopped with all of this. That. But no, no. Nay, nay. Wanted to continue to push because these prosecutors really enjoy a cross-examination. But we are not here for your amusement. <sighs> yep, Rob, the key is to know when to stop. I'm gonna move to exhibit 
50, I believe it's 53, right there. Did this line account for the trajectory of the bullet either going through glass, other objects, or a human being? That's a fair question. Well, the, as we've discussed before, I would not anticipate any deflection through the glass, but there could have been some deflection through the body. So what that would account for is, is that where I'm standing or where that string is could have moved a little bit going through the body, but I think everybody's agreed that the shotgun is inside the door, so that would limit how far you could move the shotgun side to side based on deflection due to contacting something solid inside the body. All right, so I didn't hear a yes or no. Did it account for any the, the projectile traveling through the, a human body, glass, or any other objects that were then located in that room that night? Does it account for that? Um, yes or no? Um, no, it doesn't account for okay. it, but you could, you could see you know, how that has to change or could change because the amount that you can move the shotgun around from that position is limited by the opening in the doorway. And same thing for the laser, the green laser lines we saw earlier. Does that account for the projectile passing through a human body, wood, any other object that it passed through? Did your calculations account for that, that um, trajectory? Well, that path is, is a straight line path. It could have passed through a human body. Um, you know, it passed through the layers of the uh, quail pen. Make the point. But it's, Trust it's the jury. Straight at that point. Get out. Did your calculations? I'm going to ask it again because I need a yes or no answer. Did your calculations account for uh, the projectiles in the other examination? The prosecution the experts ones? never gave a yes or no answer on the cross. Projectiles passing through an item such as wood or a human body. Did it account for that? No, I did. I did not put there that the projectile somehow interacted with anything else and was deflected. All right, I'm going to go over a few variables, if you wouldn't mind. So variables in, ca in doing all these calculations are, would, it, would you agree, it's where the gun was held? That's a variable. Not, not for the uh, trajectories. So you won't admit, you won't concede that you won't admit. where the gun was held is a variable in a calculation, such as yours. Which calculation? It doesn't <laughs> matter. Either you're, we're talking about either your shotgun calculation or your rifle one. Was where the gun held a variable that you have to account for in making this determination? Where the gun was held physically? Uh, not for the shot trajectories. Okay. All right. Will you concede then that it was a variable in the AR-300 blackout scenario? No. The shot trajectories, it doesn't matter where the gun is being held. So where the gun's held in your mind makes no difference? No. What? The gun is on the shot trajectory. I think I've right. explained that. Is it a variable of how the gun was held? Why? Uh, no. Not a variable. Is it a variable if the, move, if the party uh, shooting was moving? Again, no. The barrel of the gun was on that shot line, in my opinion. Is it a variable if the party that the bullet why, why? potentially passed through was moving? Is that a variable? No. Is it a variable to you if the party was jumping or ducking? Is that a variable to you? No. Is it a variable if the party was maybe He's turning like, no, side to side? The gun is, is here somewhere. Not for what I've done. He's okay, like, the so gun has to be on the trajectory. Asked, and all of those, you would we agree, all now. those variables that I listed include motion. Is that right? I have yes, snaps. those would all be if you were trying to figure out the orientation of the person that was shot, which is something that I did not do, and that's something I don't do. It's not my field of expertise. This guy's been very good at staying consistent and not getting annoyed when the prosecutor is being annoying. And I think it'll make the jury find him more believable at this point. I think the kneeling with the tape measure was the most effective part of this cross. I've stopped taking notes because the shark has been jumped and I was fixing, <coughs> making sure that lawnerdalert.com was working well. The judge is so annoyed. Did you hear him? You. Any further questions? The judge is going to deem them arrested and I don't think he asked. Let's stand while we're indulging. Let's stand while we're indulging the prosecution. Ugh. So, I think the witness held his ground. So, here's where we're at. I'm ready for them to stop too. All right, you guys. If you go to Law Nerd Alert, we have a cute little animation for you. LawNerdAlert.com, we're gonna be sending out weekly alerts so that you guys have all the links to the trials, all the links to the lives. And during the trials, it gives us a way to keep in touch with the international crew get you the links 
Remember, we still have redirect after this and then recross. We're only in cross-examination. All right, and, you, and further to the variables. Oh God. You just said, is it, it's not a very, is, is it not a variable to you? I'm trying to ask this as clearly as possible, sorry. Scratch, uh, strike Oh that. good, I'll go look for that. Is it a variable if the person that is uh, being shot is moving? Is that a variable to you? That is not a variable to me. And is it a variable to you if the person who's doing the shooting is moving? That is not a variable to me. Would you agree, though, in general, people do move? Uh, yes, in my experience. But the gun, move. the gun is the factor. No further questions. You ended on people do move. You had the tape measure. You knelt down. It was at a reasonable height for shooting. And then you choose to end on people do move? Ugh. Do the tape measure at the end. And now it's time so for redirect. To straighten out. He just said so Let's much to straighten with his out. Last questions. Poot's got a lot of post-its. Um, Pootie, they gave you a lot of post-its, guy. The variables. Y'all. You're an expert, I'm gonna give you a hypothetical real quick. Bullet hole, 10 feet up. Bullet hole, five feet up. What does that, what does that tell you? And the bullet's descending. Right, and if you- Well, it depends which one's the entry and which one's the exit. Where it possibly came from and where it possibly went. Yes. Okay, basically it's a line, correct? Yes. So and lines do what? What does knowing where the gun was being held have to do with any of that? It has, it has no bearing on the physics of the flight of the bullet. Bullet. It may have something to do with maybe where the shooter was positioned relative to the weapon, right? Or, you know, if, if you know, some other variable, but I'm not testifying about those subject matters. Right. Um, so okay. all the, where, you know, well, let me ask you this. The data you relied on. Not let me ask you this. The trajectories was that generated by sled yes and so there's um, there's the answer any evidence of ricochet no do they indicate any evidence of, we're relying on sled's uh, investigation through a person be mad at them no. did they didn't they test the one bullet they found in the dog shed for um dna and tissue or some sort of organic matter yes didn't find any no so you're basically just saying this is the line. Yes, this is the line. Have we crossed Based it? On Court, they the normally sled. let, they normally try to finish witnesses. Agent it's Moore, five o'clock in the east, almost five ten in the route, east. And then the out court the normally lets them finish a witness. Yes. The two people you put here are based on the angle from the dog from the quail pen going down it was an upward shot correct well chant this prosecutor would just call you a child which is rude. lead the witness though there i've heard no objections to it i haven't heard any objections either Your Honor. well the court is objective <gasps> Does not lead the witness the court interjected the leading was so bad that the court is like i've heard no objections prosecution you were asked a question about the number of <laughs> Did you review wow. Agent Worley's report of um, her notes uh, based on her visit to the location on July 20, uh, 16, 2021? Yes. Let me hand you these to see if it refreshes your memory. I said it was unlikely that this judge would raise his that. own objections. And here on day 21, we've, we've broken that dam. And the judge thought that the leading was so egregious that he decided to bring his own objection and then subtly chastise the prosecution for not properly objecting. Okay. He said, I'm just trying to move things along, Your Honor. And I'm just trying to get to the answers I want. Any objection to putting this in evidence? I object to all of it at this point. We're on day 21.
Those aren't my mouth noises. Somebody's near the microphone making noises. That was not me. All right, let's answer some questions while everybody's reading. Um, Life with Gigi said, I have faith. How long do you think the jury will deliberate? Okay. Just go with it. I'll let you know when, the, when closing arguments are done. It's too soon for me to, too soon for me to hasten speculation. I'm five foot two and 65 years old. I feel defended. Submit it without objection. Defended or offended, one or the other. Either way, we're here for it. I love the I'm fed up with this Emily mood. Yep, we're all tired. I'm tired of everybody. I would like them to get the point. And and some points, it's fine when it feels like they're making headway, when it feels like they are literally dragging the point behind a bus. It's exhausting and you're like, what is happening? What is okay, your point? Um, or do you just want to, are you just down a little bit? trying to no, mess with this okay, witness? That's fine, that's fine. Are you just trying so, to hammer it home? Um, what is what the is, point? What is being recorded in um, These the are the crime scene notes there. from SLED. Good. It's a SLED report, right? right? Yes, Police reports uh, are normally not evidence. Listing of Great. The Here we are. Observations. Here we are. That's evidence now. Okay. Special Agent Worley was, was uh, observing at the crime scene. Okay, so let's go down to the bottom of this page, okay? Watch there's that shadow. What's that about? I have also aged 10 years during this trial. Okay. So your hand is the tell shadow me what deck. That says. What, what, what does that mean? Those are the following bullet defects in feed room, the dog house, the small animal cage, and the workshop were scaled, labeled, and photographed. Okay, so what is the defect A, B, C, D, and E? Uh, those are five projectiles from the, in the feed room window. And I think we previously heard those those are buckshot pellets? Yes. You can't lead the witness. Okay. Go to the next page, please. So how many is that? Five. Okay. Keep going. Top of the top of the page, please. Okay. And so it can, uh, what happens here? Defect F, G, and M. Uh, F and G or projectile entered the interior side of the window. Defect K is yep, a possible it's, defect. It's odd the that they chose to do it that way. Screen. And that accounts for how many pellets? You got uh, seven. Okay, how many pellets were there? Nine. How do you know there okay. were nine? Um, some have nine, some don't, depending on the manufacturing. That's what the earlier witnesses testified to. It's one of the only things I retained. Asked about by um, the state? Yes, and I mean, there, there was a report by Tom Bevel. He talked about the the evidence. Uh, the evidence been listed. So there are several documents that you could go to to find the stuff that was. It's not in evidence, but okay. And then uh, going down, doghouse. This would be what? What is that? What does that cover? Um, Emily, maybe there was no exclusionary order in this trial, so all the witnesses are allowed to be in court. Uh, yeah, the doghouse was uh, there was the entrance defect. Then there was uh, a possible entrance defect. It was like a really small hole. Uh, no projectile recovered, and then um, there was a projectile entered the lower middle area, the southeast exterior side, exited the interior side, and entered the bedding. Uh, and the projectile was previously collected from the bedding. Okay, so um, it says a flight path I agree, was placed through defects one and something. I think that's I and I one. I and I one. Yes. Okay and was documented with photographs. You've seen those photographs? I have. An angle finder determined the vertical angle of the... <laughs> Your Honor, I'm just reading, I'm not leading him. Your Honor, I'm, I'm just reading, the document. reading it into evidence. All right. Thank you. Um, mm. An angle finder determined Your the vertical Honor, angle I'm of just the flight path reading to be it. approximately 76 degrees and a protractor, I'm sorry, protractor. Which again i don't know protractor and a plumb bob determine the horizontal nicholas i don't think they considered a prone shooter because right? all the other yes. experts said that the that, shooter was moving was that or was that based inconsistent on with the photographs the you, you saw taking bullet by strikes to uh performing those tests maggie i think it's off uh the um the horizontal angle i think was off a degree a degree right. based on the photograph right but you weren't there no so you're looking at a photograph and saying it's off a degree. But Kirsten, maybe she keep me posted on how you like those all dressed Could she ruffles? Have, and had a better perspective than you did than what you saw in the photograph? Yes. Okay. Um, small animal cage. 
um, that says defect J, pro projectile entered the exterior side of the cardboard on the southwest end of the cage, exited the interior sides of the cardboard and the chicken wire, defect J1, traveled through chicken wire on the back wall of the cage and entered the southeast wall of the workshop, defect J2, exited the interior side of the workshop de uh, wall, defect J, and struck I'll give no. I'll give thoughts in a second. It was perpendicular to the well, wall. Well, when we have a break. A flight path rod was placed through defects J. Now they're just reading the police report into the record. I don't... An angle finder determined the vertical angle of the flight path to be approximately 87 what? degrees and the horizontal um, approximately 41 degrees. And is that consistent with the photographs you saw? Yes, except for the one that, that's three degrees. Right, and that's then, three degrees. And, and then saw, there was one with one and a half, and again, for the reasons And that's why we see the two paths. You do one at one and a half, one at three. Now, LK, in the any of this, and I say go study. Anything about You're not missing anything. A, um, I'm not quite done yet. Um, <laughs> I'm done with that one. Uh, ricochet what? Or any biologic material on anything, or anything that indicated pass through a person or a wall or anything. Was there anything recorded by their agent that would indicate any of that? That was collected by their agents that would indicate any of that? No. Okay. Now, what, Stop you know what there. Is? You made the point. Uh, this is uh, Agent Worley's drawing of the window. You okay. made the and point. What does it indicate? Uh, it, it indicates the seven buckshot pellets that pass through the window. Okay. How about let's see the other the other one. This is, is a very fair point, Glenn. Uh, I don't think they knew what the witness would answer, so they didn't ask. The seven buckshot pellets went through the window. Oh, look at those. Okay, those are helpful from charts. Inside, one's from outside? Or yes. One? Okay. Yes. Those so are helpful there charts. there are seven buckshot. Oh, and which one of these um, is the one you measured through? Um, yeah, that's when, the outside. When the prosecutors are like, it's possible this, it's possible this, it's possible that. I well, there's multiple uh, reasonable possibilities. B1. That's reasonable doubt. And the prosecution which definitely got into that across. Which would be the upper left, uh, upper left most exterior Which is side, annoying. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I went, I went through B1. Okay. And is this consistent with what you saw? Yes. Um, okay. So you didn't get to look at this until October, correct? Of 20, um, 22. 22. Right. Now, these drawings, their examination was done in June and July of 21, within a month of the murders, correct? Yes. Um, and what you had to go on basically was photographs. Right? Objection to the leading room. What, if anything, did you have to rely on <laughs> to, to What, if anything, is not analysis? a cure-all? Well, the information and data that SLED collected because... I'm sorry, who collected it? SLED. Okay. <laughs> and? Right, because they were there very early on and I was not. And then also went and took a look at the physical evidence. And I found some stuff there that was helpful to my investigation itself. So it wasn't... 100% based on SLED, but, but a lot of this information came directly from SLED. Okay, do you know um, when uh, Alec Murdoch was charged with murder? Was it July of 22? I don't remember. But at some point, over a year after the murder. Why? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and you were retained and got out there within 90 days of his arrest, correct? Yes. Um, but they waited over a year to arrest him. Correct. Um, yes. Why aren't we objecting? Um, so, okay. My, my, my question is, I mean, these issues raised, would the <coughs> ammo that you use for your sound uh, testing, whether you were using the same brand or some different Outside brand, make the any scope. difference? No. Objection, no basis in expertise. Outside the scope of What, if any Ross. difference, would it have made in the acoustical issues you were testing, different ammo? Same None. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Was he able to answer? I'm sorry. Was he able yes. to answer that? Uh, what? Was overruled. Your answer. Thank you. Um, it makes I no didn't hear the court say uh, overruled. All the shotguns are right in the same range. It doesn't matter. The rifles are in the same range. Uh, weapons of this type are not loud enough to be heard inside the house from that distance with all the variables. Okay, you were also asked a question about the, the, the uh, how loud the sound was if you went in a laboratory, the length of the distance you said was between the, the um, kennels and the house, outside the house, and I think you said, was it 100 decibels? 
Yes, it's about like 103, 104. Okay, and he went to a chart saying that would be like a uh, airplane at 300 meters. Yes. Would you be able to hear that inside the house? Um, depends on what's going on inside the house, but you know, at that level, you would you would just. I don't want to. It's been a long day, but it depends <laughs> on where the energy of the sound is. Facts. It's called octave bands and one third octave bands. In other words, the sound oh, of a gunshot is different than the sound of a jet airplane. When did you sneak it in my office? Because over? it's not the same noise. So it's there's more to the question, but even if you basically if you, if apples to apples, if you had that level of noise outside, which it wasn't because it wasn't a laboratory setting, it was actually only about 85 decibels outside the house, which would have been audible if you're outside. You could be. You could be a couple miles away and hear these gunshots if you were outside. So if you were a couple miles away and you were outside, my, not inside my the house. My team snuck into my You, you could hear office. those shots. You could, yes. Uh, you know, about, if, as long as there's not a lot of traffic or you're not cutting the grass, if it was quiet and you're outside, you could hear those gunshots. You just can't hear them in the house. You can't hear them in the house. Why did the um, defense ask this, now, not the prosecutor? I mean, this the prosecutor should have asked. The prosecutor should have asked, but they didn't. But the defense asked, so now they're going to double down on it. Did you find any data, any reports, anything you looked at for SWED, that they did any of the trajectory calculations that you did? No. Nope. Um, they did a, a computer simulation, right? Or a scan. They scanned the same way I did. And then when you look at it, we saw it four weeks ago, there's a sort of a flop. <clears throat> the did judge told them to object, and now they're like, Faro, oh, all right. Did they do Faro computer generated? Did they do one? All yes. I know is that they did scan the scene in July. I watched just it. Just like I did, but I have not yet seen anything from them using their scan. And did they, um, again, not again, but I want to make sure I understand this. They got the, the, the information, strike that. Withdraw it. What if any information, what if any trajectory computations did they do, SWED, the state, any FBI, anybody hired by these guys over here, do on trajectory? Did you see anything? No. So the first time anybody's done any trajectory calculations is you, and as you indicated, we were going through that PowerPoint last night trying to make sure it was understandable. Objection to testimonial. <laughs> Dick looks like he's so done. Sort of, um. He's just like, ugh. 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 One last question. Promise? Was there anything to prevent SWED, FBI, anybody from doing the same calculations you did? Well, just two, two last questions. Um, did, that you did. Anything <laughs> preventing them? Do they have any? What if any uh, <laughs> obstacles were there to sled or calls FBI? For speculation. Or one of these private people they hired doing the same thing you did. It just calls for speculation. And let me get this straight. He kept talking about children five foot two. Young lady, stand up. Oh gosh. That's a quirk in my office. She's five foot three. So. Thanks, Mr. Stein. She's not a child. That's all I'm trying to point out. Objection. She's Ob Objection. Objection. Based on your calculations Ugh. and based on the assumption he could have just asked somebody would have adults can be um, adults can be either at their you hip, know, five two or at their right. shoulder. The jury knows that, though. In a, in a way when, in which you could oh, operate that weapon. Dick lied to us again, man. What, if any, One more question. you have as to whether that person could be Alec Murdoch shooting in to that quail pen? He's looking right at the jury. It can be. Thank you. That was a good last question. Once we got to it. He doesn't think it could have been Alec Murdoch. That is the last question. 
And that's as to Maggie, not as to Paul. I stopped taking notes because I'm so- I know so... you just answered that question, but it could be on anyone on that, those green lines. Is that right? Your green lines that you drew could be anyone along that green line. That is correct. Could be anyone who could fit along that green line. Is that true? The weapon is on the green line. And then so as of- So anyone could be holding before, the weapon. The next thought process is, is that, okay, for people of different sizes, what do they have to do to put their hands on the weapon to fire it Thank you. while it's sitting on that green line? So to be clear, is that a yes, anyone on that green line? As long as this gun travels on that green line, it would fit anyone on that green line? That is correct. Thank you. Sit down. And if you were down at the kennels when a shotgun was shot and a 300 mm. blackout was shot, if you were down at the kennels, would you have heard it? Yes. If you were outside, would, would you have heard it? Step down. He should have asked if you were outside near the kennels, would you have heard it? But all right, we're done for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, that if, if be it for this day. We'll resume at 5.30, 9.30 tomorrow morning. Yeah, I'm feeling you, Judge. Yes. Looking at it, it's almost 5.30 now. We'll resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Please do not discuss the case. Have a good evening. You just hold still while the jurors leave. Since it's <sighs> taking you a while to get in. Woof. The judge is done. I am done. Y'all are done. Let's see if the judge has anything to say to the attorneys. I bet that he does. I bet that he does. And well, he does that. We have a fun little animation. If you go over to lawnerdalert.com and sign up, that's where we are going to be able to keep our international crew much more informed and try to make sure that you guys yes. are notified. Oh, he's done. Recess till 930. Nothing to say to the lawyers. Make sure that y'all are kept in the loop when notifications don't always go out. During trial, I am generally streaming from gavel to gavel. So 8, 25, 8, 30 in the morning till 5, whatever, or 4, whatever, 30 CT. So I will send those out and then round them up at the end of the week when we get it. So if you head on over there, the link is up above. Um... Oh, I typed that in wrong. And let's see. Some, some we are, uh, make sure it is lawnerdalert.com. And let me type this in and pull it up for you. And we will see it. Why is this giving me, I don't have errors half the time and some of the time I do. So apologies with that. We have set the system up today. No errors earlier, errors now. So I will take a look and um, and find out why, because I it worked. It worked until I needed to tell you about it. And now as I'm telling you about it, I know over over a hundred of you have already signed up. No, over three hundred of you have already signed up. So with that, um, let me just check one more way uh, and see why it's not. You can also use Law Nerd Alerts with an S. Some will get you there. It's Law Nerd Alert or Law Nerd Alerts will get you there. But we have, um, I will also put just a direct link in it because it's a redirect to the website. So for those of you that are there, but once you see, once you see the cat and the gavel, you're there, name, email, and we will keep you in. It might be traffic related and that's very fair. It might be traffic related. So Runkle, y'all are telling me Runkle is not happy about what happened today. Um, let me go look. So we are, we are the link, Lynn, we are working on it, Leslie, but I put the direct link in the chat too. You can go to emilydbaker.com slash law nerd alert or law nerd alert or law nerds alert. And then I will send out the link in the spaces, the Patreon spaces and everything else. So you can sign up. It might be traffic related. Look, we, we try to break things when they're new. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we do. So it should work for you, but it will give us a way to communicate and get you all signed up. So it might be traffic related and I'll go take a look. Um, let's do a quick, let's at least the cat is just, I'm, I'm overjoyed by that. So we're there. So we're there. Um, Runkle is not at all happy. Hold on. Let me go. Let me go find Find what Runkle had to say. If he put up a short on it, I will go find it and and go take a look. Um, over at Runkle of the Bailey. I'm sure he wasn't. I wasn't either. I wasn't either. 
<laughs> Murdoch trial insanity defense lawyer. Okay, here we go. We're gonna pull this over. All right, let's give us let's give us a, a swoop and then um Miguelina, I'll give you a link to this so we can put a link to this in the chat. I love that Runkle popped on to to pop off, I think is what happened. But let's go take a look at this. And I love that y'all already went and checked it out. So let's go over to see what Runkle has to say on YouTube shorts. Oh, by the way, Runkle is a um, attorney. He's also a, I believe a firearm instructor. He is on, um, on here on YouTube at Runkle of the Bailey. And I want to make sure I have the sound on. All right. Let's see. Let's see what, Run let's see what Runkle has to say. I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's delightful. Oh, I should swoop. You're right. All right. Swoop a doop. And then wrinkle it. Defensive firearms lawyer, and I have some comments about a moment <laughs> that happens in the Murdoch. If you're wondering, ah! I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer, and I have some comments about a moment that happens in the Murdoch trial. Yeah, I bet you do. Tempting, but um. Yep. Good. I'm not the it only one horrified. Looks like he's got that pointed at the prosecution table. I'm going to give him the credit of assuming it was pointed over them. It's still not acceptable. It's not funny. People laughed at that. They shouldn't. Uh, guns are not a toy. Guns are not a joke. You always treat a gun as if it's loaded. You never point it at something. Guns are not a prop. To shoot. This is unacceptable. If I was the judge in that courtroom, I would have asked the jury to leave, and I would have torn a strip off this lawyer, and he would not touch iron in my courtroom again. I'm a Canadian. Well, Run we Runkle has spoken. The defense will not touch happened. iron in his courtroom again. Runkle, look, Runkle, gun safety is clearly not a joke. Guns are not a joke. Guns are not the punchline of a joke. We're in the middle of a double homicide trial where two people were brutally murdered, and he seemed, from all of our rewatching, to be pointing it at the prosecution table, even if not directly at the prosecutors, at the prosecution table saying tempting. <sighs> I don't know if the prosecution will address it with the judge tomorrow, but I agree with Runkle. Um, it's just, it's just, we will link Runkle's rant. It's over on his channel. The casualness of this courtroom has pushed too far. I can, I can understand when stylistic differences happen. I, I don't love when Creighton is crawling around on the floor of the courtroom and laying down on the floor of the courtroom. Stylistic difference. It's not inappropriate. It's not improper. It's a stylistic difference. But once you have something like that, I also think it's improper. I well, you saw my immediate reaction was holy shit. Um, and maybe they'll address it tomorrow, and maybe they won't. I don't know. I just, I just don't know. I just don't know. <sighs> Lauren V over on Twitter said, Emily, it's official. This trial has broken my laptop. Sigh. As a five foot two human who didn't expect to be attacked today. I know every everyone under under about five four felt attacked today. We love you, law nerds. We love you. Law nerds of all shapes and sizes. We love you. Um, it's just <sighs> it might not be addressed. We'll see what happens in the morning. But I love, I love Runkle. I, I feel so much better that Runkle's like, I'm here with you. I feel you. Our rage is joint rage. <sighs> Let's do a quick summary, if we even can. I don't even know. I stopped taking notes this afternoon because I was so tired of them going back and forth. The rest of the afternoon today was the defense reconstruction expert and cross-examination of the defense reconstruction expert. In that cross-examination, we saw the prosecutor ask about yeeting a phone from a moving vehicle and the factors that would need to be considered and the fact that this witness did not have all of those factors to really make a scientific um, uh, determination about yeeting a phone. But the witness, I think very calmly, held his ground saying, no, but there are some things that are certain facts, and that's regarding motion and velocity and things like that. So talking about the fact that a phone could have tumbled or could have been thrown flat with the phone being yeeted out the window. The prosecution then got into back and forth on how high the shooter's hand, like the trigger hand, would have needed to be with the weapon um, or the hand holding the weapon off of the ground and used a tape measure to show that. And then I thought very powerfully knelt down to show where his hand would have been with regard 
to the ground. I thought it was a very powerful demonstration that just down on a knee, one knee with one leg up, you could have easily made the shots that they were saying were so improbable to make. But then he lost the plot and didn't stop there and continued wandering into the Everglades where we now live, fighting with this witness over whether or not there were numbers on his chart of when the um, speeds were were moving and all the rest of it. And so the cross-examination wandered into fighting with this witness and then saying, okay, so an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, so these children at 5'2", it got a little flippant. I think it may be a little bit too flippant for the jury. He made some good points, and I think maybe they got lost in the fact that he started getting really snarky with the witness. If the witness gets snarky first, it's different. I didn't feel, chat let me know, but I didn't think that this witness got snarky with him first. I really didn't. I think he started snarking with the witness first. And he got very frustrated, like, I asked for a yes or no answer. Counsel, you're, all of your experts did the exact same thing with the defense. This is the game. This is the game. This is it. So with that, we then got a redirect and a recross. The judge during the redirect from Poot objected to leading. The judge lodged his first own objection in this case to leading. And Poot's like, I'm just trying to move it along. And then we saw some back and forth. The chat thinks he got a little snarky with his laptop. I think he was trying to say, well, I could answer it this way. And counsel was like, well, it's not on your chart. And he's like, well, it's in my laptop. It's a big file. Maybe. I didn't think it was too snarky. Um, I didn't. I think he was trying to be precise. But this courtroom felt really casual this afternoon. Um, and Metters, my cousin video attorney, sat there the whole day was like this. He was just over it. His He was all of us today, I think. All of us were kind of over it by the end. And, and by the time we were done, uh, Poot and his redirect, no, and his redirect was saying, yeah, but these are the numbers you're basing it off of, off of SLED's measurements, and brought it back to the fact that the witness was basing all of his things off of SLED's, um, off of SLED's investigation. But then the DA, not the DA, the AG was arguing, or the prosecutor was arguing, yeah, but these casings could have moved. I'm like, are you arguing that the casings aren't exactly where we think they are because SLED didn't preserve it or because they bounced? So it felt like the AG was almost arguing against his own witnesses and his own case because the AG started arguing, well, this is possible and that's possible. Well, if everything's possible, you're not going to get this case beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. If it's like, could be anything, well, if it could be anything, then it could very easily and reasonably not be Alec Murdoch. So there were points I think the prosecution got too into their own um, cross-examination of this witness and kind of wandered a bit far afield. Um, oh, I'm getting texts from... The hubs. Um, Warren is telling me that over 500 are signed up, which is fantastic. Um, and I appreciate it. So let us thank you for signing up for Law Nerd Alerts. We will make sure to keep you in the loop. So you have in the evening during the trial, I'm going to try to make sure you get the links for the next day so that you have them and you can go to YouTube and just hit you, notify me and we'll get there. I'm going to answer a few questions and then I've got kiddo stuff that I need to go do. Ellie mug just arrived shattered. Just email us at help at emilydbaker.com. We'll get a replacement sent out. It happens on occasion with mugs and we get those replacements sent out really quick. So um, it is difficult with mugs, but it's it gets replaced very quickly. So just shoot us an email if you have a mug issue and we will get a replacement sent out stat at no cost to you, of course. Um, Chermfelt said, if they argue potential, quote, hit from drug trafficking, and bring in a connection with Eddie. Um, I don't think the Mexican cartel has been mentioned in all of this at all, which as a defense attorney in NC, I attest they are very active. I didn't know that. The average height is 5'4". I don't think they've argued that at all. I don't think we have any evidence of that at all, but the defense might bring that in and ask about what, about what that is. They might. They've definitely leaned into that. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, and again, outside my scope of knowledge, but I trust that that's inside your scope of knowledge. Prosecuting, prosecution needs to watch true crime web, web IRL reenactment. Okay. Becca said, I am a grown athletic five foot two female. Short people get no respect. We respect you, Becca. People come in all shapes and sizes. Putin needs a nappy nap. I think Pooty Poot did need a nappy nap at the end of the day. To be fair, so do I. Welcome to reading with Dick. He was just reading a police report into the witness or into the record. It was wild. 
How can the witness say that the where the gun is held and how it is held isn't a variable in shot trajectory, but he'll say the shooter is 5'2"? I think that was one of the more powerful points that he's like, it doesn't matter what the shooter's doing. And he's like, oh, so if the shooter's jumping around, it doesn't matter on shot trajectory, which I think everyone would say, mm, no. Bees on Mars said Jim's Twitter fingers and Poot's trigger fingers both were unfortunate. Today's been wild. And then Buster testified. The way I was like, no, when he was like, Richard Alec, the, the defense calls Richard Alec Murdoch Jr. I was like, oh. I was like, is he just calling the defendant as the first witness? That's not happening. One of the prosecutors held his hands up like a target before Poot said tempting. I didn't see, I will go back and look for it. I went and looked for the three, for the, uh, for the three feed video. And when I saw the three feed video, I saw Poot smile and say tempting. So if the prosecution was doing that, then that would be why they didn't object because they baited the comment. I think what Poot did with the weapon exemplifies what Murdoch and his powerful friends have been getting away with in court forever. It might be. Um, if you love all shapes and sizes, why can't you list bigger sizes on your merch page? We do. We have, we don't stop at 2X. We have sizes up to 5X. So most the things that we are available in up to 5X, we list up to 5X, but we list them under a separate listing. So we'll have um, extended sizes listed in their own listing so that they're easier to sort on the website and find. So we do. Um, they don't stop at 2X. And we have quite a wide variety that goes to 4 and 5X. So they're up there. I think we need, quote, him tempting, hmm, tempting merch and then donate the proceeds to gun violence awareness in Poot's name. Um, I will think about it. I don't know. I don't like that moment. I don't know if I want to memorialize that in merch, even for a good cause. I think we can raise money in a better way. Um, Robin Rando said, all five foot of me is offended. <laughs> um, Ian doesn't play when it comes to firearms. We know that for sure. We know that for a fact. I've never seen a more laissez-faire prosecution or defense ever, literally ever. Suggest trial Amazon Prime to order all dress chips. Um, I think that's a great idea to do a trial of Amazon Prime to get the all dress chips. I think that the shooter shot Paul and them fell back on the recoil and then fired the shots from the ground. For Paul's shots, notice that they didn't talk about Paul's shots much. They talked a lot about the shots with regard to Maggie. Carolyn asked question, if there is a mistrial, would that give the prosecution, uh, I think, time to prepare to present their case more effectively, introduce additional new evidence, and include additional charges? It, I mean, it would give them time for that, but they'd also be stuck with some of the stuff they've done in this trial because it's in transcripts. I don't think the prosecution's trying to bait a mistrial. That doesn't always go their way. Um, so I don't think they're trying to at all. I think they need to get through all of this. Janice said, all of the testimony today seems hinky and suspect. I don't know that I'm buying what they're selling. What are your thoughts, Emily? It All of the testimony, by the time we get to the defense case, if jurors have their minds made up, the testimony gives the jurors um, room to say no. This is why I don't agree with the prosecution. And, and this is what this witness said. And this is what this witness said. So they are they are now giving the, the words for the jurors that advocate for not guilt what they need or are trying to sway the jurors that don't have their minds made up yet, which they're not supposed to but human nature is human nature. I think that it's their job to confuse it. I don't know. I think there was some fair, some fair testimony, the sound testimony. I don't know if it was that helpful, but it might be to these jurors. You never know, but also common sense. Everyone in the chat was like, I live near people that shoot. And this is an area where people shoot readily. And so the jurors life experience, if their life experience does not correlate with what this witness said, they're just going to disregard it. And so for a lot of you, you were like, yeah, but I can hear things in the woods near my house, or I can hear shots from, you know, the shooting range. I did that by accident. It's, nice. it's just time to stop for the day. It scared me. I can hear things down the road. I can hear the train at night, but not during the day near me. Um, with all of the doors and windows closed and the heater running, I can hear it. So it just depends on life experience because the jury's get to decide how much weight to give this testimony and they could decide it was um it was valuable or not so it was needed i know we're like here we go so it just got so it kind of got far afield but i think there were powerful points of that that the jurors can use i don't know why they even got into the speed stuff 
I just, I really just don't. I don't know if it helped anybody. I don't know if it helped decide anything. I don't know if it helped clear anything up. I really, really don't. Um, Journey said, I heard a gun uh, murder. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry for that. Three blocks away from inside my house. And that's the thing. These jurors live in an area where hearing gunshots is not or might not be uncommon based on where they live. They might shoot themselves and be able to hear things traveling through the woods. So if it doesn't drive with their life experience, they might just be like, mm, that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, Travel Hop said our fancy convention event name can be the Law Nerds Invitational. Great cover today. Thank you. We're just going to start naming everything. That's what we learned today. What does it say about the defense case that they got an expert with no formal education training in the field he's testifying to, good or bad? I think they were trying to expand the expertise of a witness who had an expertise in an area they needed, the sound, and then they tried to expand it. Um, it doesn't mean the jury won't like it, though. All of the tests are, oh, we did that one. Thank you, Janice. Let's see. Jeanette, in many in my many years of playing Frisbee, any object can spin if you put your wrist into it, but then also, but then also mean anything. Might not spin if you throw it, right? Might not spin, might not tumble, might just like travel and fall. I don't know. Magic racer will get rid of the pink stain. I will definitely try a magic racer to get rid of the pink stain. In physics, what you are looking at projectiles falling, you assume the weight is 9.18 because that is the uh, weight gravity gives it in the air. Alicat, he was just, I don't know, when we're talking about him not having the information he needed to determine how much or how to determine items being yeeted from a car, I think it was very clear that he couldn't really testify about items being yeeted from a car because he just didn't have enough information. I think the prosecution could have and should have stopped there. Like, hey, you don't, these are all the, to make a determination about a phone and how a phone would travel out of a car, you need all of this information, correct? Yes. And you don't have that information, correct? Yes. So you can't make a determination without all that information. Right? Right. And stop. Jim Griffin supplied the guns. It was it was interesting. I don't know where the guns came from, but it was very interesting to see. So with that, um, yeet is not equal to fall, and that's very that's very true too because it seems like it was yeeted. Um, didn't hear recognize gunshots just a couple blocks away, and that can see experience. I had a witness, though they were uh, very inebriated and passed out, that didn't hear someone shot next to them when they were asleep. Didn't it did not wake them up. Did not wake them up. So that happens too. With all of that, Law Nerds, I have got a lot more work I need to do today to bring information to you. And I need to go see my kiddos. So with that, we have over 800 Law Nerds signed up. If you get an error at Law Nerd Alert, it is because we are having, well, Law Nerd problems. Here's the Law Nerd problems. Y'all are fantastic. So we've got a couple different links for you. But the law nerds are so great. You guys signed up and the traffic was uh, un unperceived by my servers. So we will absolutely make sure that that is fixed for tomorrow. So you can go to emilydbaker.com slash law nerd alert or just law nerd alert dot com. If it does not work the first time, go ahead and give it a try the second time and we will keep you in the loop. We are working on other ways to keep you in the loop because we have an international crew. The text crew doesn't work internationally. And until we get something better up and running, those are our best options. We know that the YouTube notification system can be spotty. If you are having problems with notifications, turn on notifications all and make sure that when the live populates, you go to notify me. Those go out the most reliably. But we want to make sure you don't miss anything that you're interested in seeing. And we don't want to blow up your email either. So we will find a balance. More emails during trials, less the rest of the time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being Law Nerds. A huge thank you to the mods. Even though we had a break yesterday, it still doesn't feel like it. It is, this trial is starting to wear and they absolutely have to, they absolutely have to um, figure out how to wrap this case up before the jury is just like, we're absolutely done. And with that, Law Nerds, it's good to see you and I will talk to you in the next one. Good night, goodbye. Where's my outro? There it is. We're professionals here. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 8.25 a.m. Central Standard Time.
You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>